Oh, hello there, you big fucking nerd. Are, uh, are y'all having problems with the stream buffering? Big, big fucking worm. With hot worm fucking all over. Are y'all having problems with the stream buffering? Because on my phone, uh, it's like not doing so hot. Just tell me if everything's like all good, please, before we, we start. Stream's fine? Okay, great. It's just must be uh, Twitch being weird. All right, cool. Um, we're gonna give it, like, a few more seconds. Give it one more minute. Y'all can tell me how we're doing tonight. Talk about our feelings. Because I sure have a lot of them. Been saying... <laughs> Christopher Walken reads worm worse now I okay you're welcome to just leave and not want worm that's fine too you can do that I'm not I'm not forcing you to stay here and listen to my my voice Christopher Walken reads worm was a dark and Stormy night. I was controlling some bugs. I bet y'all are just excited for Tuesday night. Let me go back to Empress Teresa. That's what I bet y'all are excited for. I bet you're all like Zach. Why aren't we reading Empress Teresa right now? Why are you reading this garbage? And to that I say, we gotta we gotta sit through the garbage before we get to the good stuff. Can we turn this biblical? Um, no. I mean, well, actually, you know, yeah, if you if you want to do some good old Bible study, if you want me to start reading passages out of the Bible at, like, random intervals in Ben Shapiro's voice, we absolutely can. <laughs> I hid these worms up my ass for eight long years through the Viet Vietnam POW camp. Can we, can we insert God into every sentence? Oh, so, okay, so we're going to do, like, the opposite. Of what the author's like, instead of just beating down Taylor and not having her grow as a character, we're just going to be like, Taylor's already perfect. Everyone likes her. Um, everyone respects her. She's the most, she's undisputably the most powerful, uh, superpowered person in Worm. Yeah, we can, we can do that. We can do that. We can be like, Taylor prays to God every night. And that's why she uh, she is the way she is. And if you pray to God too, then you'll wake up with cool superpowers. I think that sounds reasonable. Yeah, we can turn, we can turn this biblical. Why not? I'll talk to the author and just be like, dude, I love Worm, but 
there's not enough Bible study in it. So why even bother? Characters aren't like dropping to their knees and praying. So, so, so why bother? Is it why 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 is it worth it? The real worm was the faith we made along the way. That's true. The real worm was the church we all went to. I'm going to give it a couple more minutes here. And we can start. We can start the inferior story. The inferior story of, of, of Zach's streams. <sighs> we, I, um, I slow cooked for the first time today. I made a very good dinner. It was very good. My, my, my tummy is, is full. The brisket. I made brisket sandwiches. My mom went out and got, um, sweet baby. Yeah, regular cooking with slow-mo. We got sweet baby Ray's barbecue sauce. I slathered it on that shit. It was very good. Yeah, my mom neglected to tell me that we had a slow cooker until, like, the end of last month. Or maybe even, like, after that. Like, I think it was this month, actually, that she told me that, like, we've had a slow cooker for, like, a, a long, long time. Um, And I'm like, Mom, why have we not slow cooked anything there are recipes in here that we can make and they don't seem very hard so we did and it, it paid off it's great you just let it sit for like 3,000 years and 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 then once you once you like get it all done it just tastes amazing I should also change the, um, stream title. It's not Shitty Story Tuesdays anymore. There we go. Yeah, regular cooking with slow-mo. It was very good. I highly recommend slow cooking your shit. Just slow cook everything. Why do you need time? Just go about your day and make sure shit's in a slow cooker. Still cook your breakfast, eat it at like six o'clock in the at night. Slow cook your lunch, eat it at like one in the morning. Repeat the process all over again. Sunday worm shirt session. <laughs> Sunday worm shirt session featuring the slow cooker. Overnight oats. I gotta try that. God will worm his way into your... That's that's the slogan for the Church of Worm. God will worm his way into your heart. Don't they say hell in this? There, there had to be like at least one hell that they said in this. And that's not Christian. That's not kosher at all. Alright. I think we can begin. Um, uh, we can begin the first psalm of worm cautionary hell. Yeah, caution. There's some there's some bad language in this. Uh, if y'all don't want to hear some fucks or some shits, I would I would suggest cover your Christian ears until I can say I I can I can tell you that it's all right to listen. But yeah, we can uh, we can begin. All right, so. <laughs> <clears throat> Agitation 3.6 Think of it as a game, Lisa said A high-stakes uh, variant of cops and robbers A steady downpour of rain thrummed against uh, th thrummed? Yeah, thrummed against the outsides of the van Lisa was driving The rain drowned out all the noise of all traffic around us And muted our view of the surroundings Making the interior of the car an island in the midst of downtown 
Traffic was a deadlock, so bad that Lisa had to put the van into park and turn on the, turn off the engine to break the silence. I asked Lisa why some villains didn't get their secret identities revealed when they got caught. I'd apparently stumbled into one of her favorite topics. I suppose it was good that she was in a mood to talk, because I wasn't. I think... I... I... I think, I ventured, that it's a little closer to real cops and robbers than the schoolyard game. No, no, hear me out. Grown adults running around in costume, making up names for themselves? It's ridiculous, and we know it's ridiculous, even if we don't admit it out loud. So there's capes like you and me when we go out in costume, and it's fun. Maybe we have some agenda or goals, but at the end of the day, we're getting our thrills, blowing off steam, and living a second life. Then there's the crazies, the people who are fucked in the head. Oh! Uh-oh, we got our first F word. There are people who are fucked in the head, maybe dangerous, if there's not something or someone to keep them in line. The people who take it all too seriously are those guys you wouldn't want to get on the wrong side of, even if they don't have powers. Lung, Oni Lee, Heartbreaker, she paused. Bitch, I replied. I, I nodded, oopsie. And then there's the monsters, the really dangerous motherfuckers. Uh-oh, there's gonna be a lot of cursing this chapter. Who are barely human anymore, if all. The Slaughterhouse Nine, Nilbog, the Endbringers, I interjected. Ooh, okay. Little side note. These things are like my favorite part of the entire series. I love the Endbringers. I'm not going to tell you what they are. They've already given you what you need to know. But the Endbringers are so fucking cool. Like, I'm like, yeah, this series is ticking off all the boxes, but you know what it needs? And then it just popped right in front of my face, and I said, yes. Hell yeah. The Endbringers are so fucking sick. I love them. But you, I need to stop talking about them, because they're a little far off. Lisa paused. Right, but you have to understand, 90% of what goes on when you're in costume, it's the first group. Adults in costume playing full contact cops and robbers and with, what, with fun as fuck superpowers and toys. This mindset applies to people without powers, too. The way I see it, having a local team of superheroes is like having a sports team. Everyone's rooting for them. Make, they make for great media that isn't about wars or water crises or whatever. There's merchandising and tourists. All the good shit that local government loves. But what happens is having a team... What, what good is having a team if there's no competition? Which is where we come in. I figured out where she was going. Exactly. At the end of the day, we're not doing much harm. Property damage, theft, a few civilians getting hurt if they don't move out of the way fast enough. But insurance payouts cover that stuff, and people aren't that much worse off. The property damage is covered, and the injured bystander has a great story to tell at the water cooler. The city gets re revenue in an indirect way from merchandise, tourism, and the rising property that come with being in an exciting city. Compared to the psychos and monsters out there, it's almost like the city's best interest to keep us in circulation. As far as I see it, we're not that much better or worse than the so-called good guys. We face more risk at the end of the day, with the possibility of jail time and physical danger, but we get a better payoff. We just took the path that was higher risk, higher reward. And that's what I love about the series, is that there's like a reason given that, you know, all the, the villains basically just aren't in jail. I mean, if they're if they're dumb and I in chapter one, you and I mean in arc one, you saw Lung uh, get arrested, but only because Taylor basically allowed him to. And you know, we'll get we'll get into the whole like capturing villains thing later. Um, I think they already mentioned the bird cage, but we'll 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 get to that later. <clears throat> I'm not sure. I said carefully. That I, I'm not sure that I buy all that. No? Then why don't you send people like Uber straight to the birdcage after his trial, like they are with Lung? The amusing but relentlessly harmless villains get a regular jail cell. They inevitably break out before the trial concludes and the cat and mouse game starts again. Sure, there's three strike rule and he'll get sent to the birdcage eventually. The people in charge have to maintain some plausible deniability. I didn't think it was there was a way I could argue against Lisa's theory without giving too much of my own perspective away. I just kept my mouth shut and turned my knife on, over in my hands. Direct from our anonymous boss. It sported a blade like a little over six inches and a texture handle with three symmetrical indents on each side for grip. 
According to Lisa, it was strong enough to use as a miniature crowbar if I had mine to. My extendable combat baton was tucked away in the panel of my armor where I kept my pepper spray. But the real evidence to my cops and robbers theory, Lisa continued, is the reaction you see when someone crosses the line. You heard about it happening. Someone finds out another cape's secret identity, goes, uh, goes after their cape's family, or a cape wins a fight and decides his downed opponent is in a state to say no if he's feeling lusty. Word gets around, and the cape community goes after the fucker, protecting the status quo and keeping the game afloat. But enemies call a truce, everyone bands together, flavors get call- favors get called in, everyone does their damnedest to do the put, put the asshole down. Like we do with the Endbringers. Yeah! I said, I shattered my, I sheathed my knife. Oh, I just, I, I love the Endbringers. They're so cool. Holy fuck, Lisa said, slapping the sides of the steering wheel with her hands. I think if the van had been moving, she would have hit the brakes for emphasis. Traffic was starting to move, though she started up the car and put it in the gear. Twice you bring the Endbringers up in f- as many, m- twice you bring the, up the Endbringers in as many minutes. You're being morbid. What's going on? I stared out the window at downtown Brockton Bay. Hundreds of people with umbrellas and raincoats. A few intrepid individuals bolting, bolting down the street with a briefcase or newspaper over their head to ward off the downpour, as they may, as they made their way to or from their work, or their on their lunch hours. It's hard to talk to Lisa as much as I liked her as a person. I felt like I was walking on eggshells. If something, if I said something, would that give her the puzzle piece she needed to figure me out? I had been lucky so far, but. Relying on that su- relying on luck sucked. I was counting on the ruse continuing, whether it was because I enjoyed the temporary companionship of Brian, Lisa, and Alec, or because I wanted to get Groove, Tattletail, Regent, and Bitch carted off the jail and prove Arms Master wrong. I was aware how paradoxical those two interests were. But right now, maybe for the first time since Bitch had set her dogs on me, I felt painfully out of place in the group dynamic. We were robbing a bank, and I was the only one who was, who was guilty about it. Apparently the only one who worried about the safety of the bystanders and hostages. There was the fact that Arms Master had said two members of the Undersiders were murderers, and doubt was tainting every interaction I had with these guys. When I was smiling about a joke, when I was smiling about a joke Alec made, was I enjoying the joke of a killer? I liked Brian, but now... I was looking back on how he had pointed out the, how to brutally disable someone in a fight, and I was wondering if he'd ever gone one step further and snapped someone's neck. It wasn't 100% impossible to imagine one of the secrets Lisa was so fond of kept, include, kept of keeping included murder either. I felt like every interaction with these guys was spoiled now, and there was somebody I could ask to clarify the lingering questions. Nobody I could ask to clarify the lingering questions. Hold on. Okay. <clears throat> Well, fuck them, Lisa stated. I raised an eyebrow in response. She went on. See, I know you. Believe it or not, I like you. Did you... Did, did from the first time I saw you on that roof, opposite lung... Oh, did from the time I saw you on that roof, opposite lung... You know how we fear the unknown. You know how we fear the unknown? Well, I know stuff, and that's my whole thing. And that motherfucker is one of the very few people who can spook me. You, Taylor, stood up to him. In a manner of speaking, anyways, the way I'd remembered it, I'd curled up in a fetal position when the undersiders came to rescue my rescue. I didn't correct her. So this guy or girl that's got you down in the dumps. Oh, oh. So this guy or girl that's got you down in the dumps. I say fuck them. They don't know you. They don't know what you're capable of. I would have stopped myself if I could right there, but the irony of her statement was too rich. I grinned, looking down at the window to hide the expression from Lisa. I saw that. Don't think I didn't. So I have shaken the doldrums from you. Good. Now look to our left. Who uses the who uses words like doldrums anyway? I actually know that word because of a song that I love. And it's funny that Worm said that. I voiced my thoughts as as I obeyed her instruction. She only chuckled in response. As I realized what I was looking at through was looking at through the rain with the past traffic I swallowed hard. It was a stone fixture six stories tall with crenellations on the roof and balconies, stone gargoyles at the corners, and iron iron grills on the window. The entryway had had wide stone stairs like a courthouse, with statues of rearing horses with wild manes on either side. The name of the institution was etched into the stone above the doors. The Brockton Bay Central Bank, a virtual castle. In 20 minutes or so, we are going to be leaving there. Tens of thousands of dollars richer. The adrenaline rush of victory pumping through our veins. Lisa's voice is barely about a whisper. Now tell me, 
Can you visualize it? Not really. Yes, I tried. Liar, she said, then she winked at me. It's okay. An hour from now, you'll be rolling in money and laughing at how pessimistic you are. I promise. Lisa pulled the van around to circle the block, then pulled into an employee parking lot behind a restaurant. As she pulled into the parking lot, bringing us right to the back of the corner of the bank, I pulled on my mask. Lisa did the same, then took a few seconds to smear her eyelids with black face paint so they blended in with her mask. I wasn't so lucky to have any funnel touches to apply, so I watched the rear view mirror nervously. It felt like an eternity, but this was probably closer to a, but it was probably closer to a minute before Brian pulled a second van into the alley that led into the lot. He parked his van halfway down the alley, blocking anyone else from coming through. As I opened the door and hopped out into the pouring rain, I managed to say the words without choking on them. Let's go rob a bank. Lisa grinned. All right. I can't remember if these chapters are like... Sh I, th I think because they're mostly action, they are shorter than the huge. Um... I, for, to me, this is where Worm gets, like, it, it, it deserves its, like, acclaimed status from, like, here on out. At least that's what I believe. All right. <clears throat> Agitation 3.7. Gru was already out of his vehicle and halfway to us by the time Tattletail and I had shut the doors of the van. He was using his power at a low degree over the entirety of his body. The darkness soaked in and into and through the porous leather of his costume, making him look like a living shadow. Brian had showed me how the visor had vents on the edges to direct the effect of his power across around the sides and top of his head, so it wouldn't obscure the face. It wasn't that he couldn't see through the effects of his own power. He could. He'd explain that the vents were there to create an effect where you could see glimpses of black painted skull floating in the vaguely human-shaped form of an even darker black. When he had the money to spend, he told me he was going to get a more complex, a more complete costume custom-made for him in the same way to expand the effect. Let's move fast, his voice echoed, reverberated with a hollowness to the sound, like an alien, like something alien and far away. He was using his power to play with sound. Tattletail, see you door. Bug, with me. Together with Gru, I returned to the van Lisa had been driving. Gru grabbed the handle of the sliding door and hauled it open, then scrambled out of the way as the contents came pouring out. I chuckled at the imagery of this spooky supervillain being caught off guard. <clears throat> I'd packed the entirety of the van minus the driver in the passenger seat with bugs. As the door opened, they spilled out to pull on a wet pavement beneath the door. Got enough? His voice echoed. I thought maybe I caught a touch of his humor in his tone but behind the influence of his power. I smiled behind my mask. Let's hope. A drive earlier in the morning had given me the opportunity to gather the swarm. It was surprising how many bugs there were in the city hidden from sight. At any point in the city, I could genu generally draw out tens of thousands of bugs from inside walls, sewers, attics, lawns, trees, and even those places you would think were too clean or occupied to have creepy crawlers, crawlies lurking around. I could do it over a matter of minutes. There weren't just the bugs I could draw on a moment's notice, though. Traveling the city had given me a chance to be picky. These were good ones, each of them fast enough to keep up with me, or capable of being carried by those that were. More than that, though, the majority of them were either durable or durable sorts like larger centipedes, cockroaches, and beetles, or capable of stinging and biting with, with bees, wasps, ants, black flies making their bulk. To round out their number, I'd gathered moths, houseflies, and mosquitoes, who weren't the best attack bugs out there, but were easy enough to get and served to distract the enemy or the, for the, or the bulk out of the swarm. There were 350 cubic feet inside the rear of the van. Tattletail had told me that. When they were packed in just tight enough that they wouldn't do any damage, and <clears throat> we wouldn't damage each other, spilled the barrier and into the front seat. It added up to a pretty amazing amount of insects. I called them out of the van and watched them as, watch as their mass seemed to expand as they spread out. We joined Tattletail at the side of the bank. I had to admit I admired the sheer change she was capable of pulling off when donning her costume. Rather, I should say I admired the effort she'd gone into as Lisa that had made her so different from her tattletale persona. Her mask was narrow, only really surrounding her eye sockets, covering her eyebrows, some of her nose and her cheekbones, but it hid the, freckle, the freckles on the bridge of her nose and changed the appear, apparent lines of her face. 
Her hair was down and loose, damping, damp from the rain, in contrast to how it was always in a ponytail or braided when she was Lisa. Her costume was skin tight, beaded with droplets of water, lavender with bands of black across the chest and down the sides of her arms, legs, and body. An image of stylized eye, only visible on the right light, given it was a dark gray on black, was worked into the costume design. A compact utility belt sat diagonally across her hips, sporting a variety of com compact pouches and pockets. Regent was keeping watch a few feet away. From what I'd seen we prepared, I now knew his costume was deceptive. He still wore the hard white mask with silver coronet, but he had shown me how the interior of the mask had foam-shaped to the contours of his face, with only his mouth left free, so he could talk without being muffled. In a similar vein, the loose white shirt he wore covered up a ma uh, mesh vest that was molded into the shape of his body. He was idly twirling a scepter in his fingers. The scepter wasn't purely thematic. Apparently, the crowned orb that topped the scepter had two electri electro electrodes built into the tines for the laser that was built into it. It was all about misdirection, misleading giving the impression of vulnerability. The fire exit at the back is, pro is protected by a digital passkey, Tiletail explained while she crouched at the keypad staring at it. Every employee has a number to get if they, if they really need to, but that rarely happens because the opening the door sets off a bunch of alarms. The password is easy. The interesting thing is that employees don't even know that, that the capes and SWAT teams have a special code they can put in if they need to make a quiet entrance with no alarms going off. To do that, you punch in the regular code 371, but you hold down the but you hold the one down, then press the number sign and asterisk key down at the same time. Voila. Try it. Group hold on the door. We waited in ten sounds for a moment before the angry blare of an alarm, but none came. Tattletale grinned at us. What I tell you. Grew signaled, and we were joined by Regent and Bitch uh, with her three dogs. The animals were the size of small ponies, their flesh having swelled and expanded enough that their fur had split at the seams. Muscle and bone showed beneath, and the arrangement of said anatomy wasn't exactly typical. The change was slow enough that you couldn't see it if you were looking for it, but if you looked away and looked back for a moment later, you could tell they were bigger than bone at the shoulder. Uh, bigger. That bone at the shoulder was longer and the eyes were deeper set, and so on. Spikes, spurs, and an exoskeleton of bone growth that appeared to fill or cover gaps that now grew in places where the bone was already close to the skin. The tail of her smallest dog, Angelica, I think Rachel called it, was twice as long and prehensile now, and the other two were well on their way. It looked like someone had torn out a pair of human spines, the meat still hanging on them, and attached them one to the other before tack tack tacking the end to a dog's hindquarters. That's a, a lovely image. <clears throat> Bitch, for, the heart, for her part, was just wearing a uh, jacket with a rough a fur rough collar and a cheap hard plastic mask of a bulldog the dogs have been given the rear of a second van allowing bitch to work her powers on them as brian drove being able to do that do the change more slowly meant she wouldn't prematurely exhaust herself or the animals by rushing the job on site we made our way into the back hallways of the bank's ground floor bitch's dogs leading my leading the way my swarm pulling up the rear the clock had started running down the moment we'd parked in the alleyway that was the point where we people might have thought something was up. Now that we were inside, though, someone knew, or would any second. At this very moment, chances were some guard in the room with the security cameras would be calling, making a call to 911 reporting a crime in progress by costume criminals. If Tattletale was right, the protector was too far away to be called in, so they would contact the wards. We had five or ten minutes before, that, before trouble showed. Each time we passed a room, Gru, Regent, and I would do a double check in it. The first few were empty, but as we reached one room, a dog took notice, and Gru raised a hand to plunge the room into darkness. A second later, he stepped back into the hallway, twisting the arm of a cringing 30-something man in a gray suit behind his back. I hadn't even realized Gru had entered the room in the first place. In the next room, Regent grabbed another hostage. I, gra I caught a glance at the man, graying hair and thick around the middle with a pink dress shirt and no jacket, staring us with his eyes wide. He opened his mouth, thinking it was an intent to cry for help, but broke down into coughs and sputters instead. A second later, he kneeled over and collapsed onto the floor. He tried to climb to his feet, but his elbow buckled and he hit the ground a second time. While he continued to struggle, Regent strode into the room with an almost lazy air, grabbed, by the grabbed him by the collar and shoved him towards the hallway where we stood. Defeated, Pink Shirt didn't resist, half walking, half crawling as forward as he joined us. He met eyes with other employees 
with uh, with the other employee, but didn't say anything. We all, we only passed a dozen offices, but it felt like three times that number. Gru was on point, glancing into each room and watching for the danger up ahead, with Regan keeping an eye on one room in our to our right. That meant I wasn't paying attention to the rooms on our left, as well as keeping an eye out on the swarm to our rear. Each time I looked into an office, lunchroom, or conference room, I prayed it would be empty. I didn't want to have any more responsible any I didn't want to be any more responsible for all this than I had to. When I saw the last office was vacant, I was relieved enough that I had nearly forgotten my role in the next stage of the plan. We reached the front lobby of the bank, and bitches' dogs charged into the room. They were nightmarish, barking, growling, and shaking themselves into a spray of, of bits of in, in a spray of bits of fur and blood as they abruptly grew another foot taller at the shoulder. I had a moment's glimpse of twenty or thirty bystanders, uh, another six or so employees of the bank before the lights went out. Grew used his power and the room was plunged in darkness, the volume of the screams and walls dropping to an utter silence in a matter of seconds. We stood in the entryway to the lobby, and there was only nothingness when the bank, where the bank lobby had been. Your move, bug girl, Tittletail said, reaching forward to put a hand on my shoulder. I closed my eyes. With mental command, my bugs, my bugs flooded into the room with the hallways behind us, flying and crawling over, under, and around us to spread throughout the room. I noted every person in the lobby my bugs made contact with, and I had several bugs crawling on each, each individual. I took five seconds to do a double check I'd gotten everyone, and ber- and belatedly remembered that two employees we had brought forward in the front in the back offices. A group of bugs returned from the darkness, brushing my skin on their way to make contact with the pair. Done, I said. Gru swept, Gru swept his arms forward and the darkness parted. We moved into the room as a group. Pink shirt and a younger guy collapsed to the ground as we walked. I suppose it was Regent's work there. Some of the some of Gru's darkness clung to the surfaces of doors and the windows, but the room was otherwise clear in a ma- in a matter of moments, lit only by fluorescent lights. Everyone except for us was lying on the ground, lying on the floor, crouched behind a desk or held in the can- huddled in the corners. Jesus, cannot read today. Two of Bitch's dogs were standing in the fr- in the front of the main entrance, while the smallest was standing near the vault. All three of the monsters were the size of cars now. Fifteen minutes, I called out to the room, my heart in my throat. We won't be able to. We won't be able. We won't be here any longer than that. Stay put. Stay quiet, and we'll be gone before fifteen minutes are up. You'll be free to give your statement to the police, and then go about your day as usual. This isn't a TV show. This isn't a movie. If you're thinking about being a hero, don't. You'll only get yourself or someone else hurt. I held up my finger. I held up my hand, finger outstretched, as a, fil- a, mil- a familiar spider perched on the tip. If you're thinking about running, making a phone call, or getting in our way, this is a good re- reason to reconsider. This little creature and her hundred sisters I brought into this room are under my complete control. I had a spider drop from my fingertip, dangling by a thread, by a way of demonstration. She's a black widow spider. A single bite has been known to kill a full-grown human or put them into a coma. You move, talk, or try to kill the spiders I just put in your bodies, in your clothes, in your hair. I'll know in a split second, and I'll tell them to bite you several times. I stopped to let that sink in. I looked over the room. Forty or so people. I saw a full-grown man with a tear rolling down his cheek. A teenager with freckles and brown curls was glaring at me with raw loathing in her eyes. At one of the counters, a matronly bank employee was shaking like a leaf. My my taking hostages like this? It had been my idea, so help me. As horrible as it was, it had been necessary. The worst case scenario was some regular schmuck in the bank pulling some stunt and getting themselves or other or others hurt or killed. I couldn't let that happen if there was a position to help it. If it meant keeping them quiet and out of the way, I was willing to terrorize them. As I saw the effect I'd had on these people, that justification felt really thin. I was going to hell for this. I hope everyone's enjoying the... Uh... Sunday Worm Church session so far. Yeah, we're definitely going to finish... Um, I say we're going to finish Act 3 tonight. I'll see how much time I have left. We might go into a little bit of Arc 4. I'll see how much time I have left once we're done with Arc 3. Because we're almost done. And this is the fun. This is this is where the fun begins, as a, a wise Jedi once said. 
<clears throat> Let's take one more sip of water. And we can begin. I think I've also gotten used to, like, reading this a little bit better. It's easier on my voice as well. Like, my throat is not going to be killing me by the end of this. I, I, at least I think so. I hope so. Um, it seems like I've gotten a little bit better at reading and not stumbling over my words every five seconds. So, yeah. <clears throat> Any trouble? Oh, 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 oh. agitation 3.8. Any trouble? Gru asked Tattletail. We're okay for now. We'd gone over the plan I'd, until I'd wor been worried I would start murmuring about it in my sleep. I joined Tattletail, Gru, Re a bitch, and the largest of the three dogs as we headed in the sealed vault door. Regent watched at the front door with two other dogs. His power had a good range so he could delay any approaching opposition long enough for us to get into position. Oh, excuse me. Holy shit. Telltale took hold of the stainless steel wheel that jutted out from the front vault and spun it, then stopped. She repeated the process, going right, then left, then right again for an I indeterminably long time. Just when I'd hoped the hope, just when I had held, ha as I say, I I've been doing better reading this. I'm sitting here like dying over my words right now. Oh my god! Just then, just when I had. The hopeful thought that maybe she wasn't able to get in. There was a sound. There was a sound of something heavy shifting inside the door. The front. The four of us hauled the door open, and Tattletail sauntered off to where the bank manager worked. She sat herself down at the computer, pulling her, putting her feet up on the corner of the desk, and began typing away. From there, she could keep an eye on the media, watch the surveillance cameras, and remotely control locks on door locks and alarm systems. All the right passwords, of course, but that wasn't a problem for her. Gru, Bitch, and I started strapping a camera harness onto one dog that wasn't standing at the front door. I was gradually working out which was which. I think Bitch called this one Brutus. He was the biggest, with the meatiest body, and a <laughs> meaty, and a, had a shorter snout. He'd been the Rottweiler before. He turned his massive head towards me until the deep-set eyeball was just to the left of my head. The, purple na the pupil narrowed into a dot. There was just the bloodshot white of the eye and a yellow gray of an iris as broad as my hand, as my hand span. I knew the worst thing to do would be to show fear or nervousness, so I was careful to breathe slowly and focus on buckling the straps and making triply sure that they were fastened tight. I was maybe being a little too firm just to ensure Brutus didn't think I was weak or shy. Not that it mattered, I seriously doubted I could make him flinch, even with one, one, of, one, of, the, one of my weapons in hand. While the harness, with the harness securely fastened, we headed into the vault, Brutus standing at the front door. The vault was stainless steel from top to bottom, with, ne with neatly banded bundles of organized of bills. Oh my god, with neatly bundled hun bundles, neatly banded <laughs> bundles of bills. That is a hard sentence. Oh, hello, Danger. Um, I'm, I'm struggling over to read. I'm struggling to read after I praise myself for doing better tonight. Uh, we're in the middle of a super-powered bank robbery. Uh, the stacks, in turn, were organized by the size of Bill, all neatly set up against the wall. On the wall opposite the stacks were, were drawers like an elaborate filing cabinet. They were pretty much just that. The bank kept copies of an important document for local branches here in a fireproof vault in case of disaster. The far end of the vault had another door opening into an elevator that, <clears throat> that went down to the garage basement where the armored trucks could be loaded. It was a shame it wasn't an option for an escape route. The door, the elevator, and the garage itself were all firmly locked outside of the specific time and days. Bitch dumped an armload of bags onto the ground and she and I got on our knees on either side of the pile and began stuffing one of the bags with cash. She took off her mask to see what she was doing better. Gru, for his part, withdrew a short crowbar from the width of darkness and sm smoldered around his body. He set to cracking open the filing drawers with the squealing noise of metal creaking and bending. As Bitch and I f filled the first bag, 
we buckled it closed. So, uh, cinched? Cinched the accompanying strap tight around it, and with mutual effort, slid it across the slick metal floor towards Brutus. Gru turned away from the drawers to grab the bag, haul it up, and attach it to the dog's harness. Yeah, we were at the we at the higgest. It was a staggering amount of money as Bitch and I worked. I started trying to count the money I was putting into the bag. 500, 1,000, 1,500. Bitch was working just as fast as I was, so I could double that. Just taking a second to wrap my head around what the total amount what would be per bag made me lose track. We filled the second bag and slid it across the floor. Gru grunted as he heaved up to the opposite side of the first bag and clipped it into place. While we filed the third bag, he clipped one more. A bag filled with the contents of the first drawer he had opened. According to Lisa's briefing, the drawers would hold deeds, li, uh, li, lien, lens, liens, insurance form, mortgages, and loan information. Apparently, our employer was willing to buy the, buy these from us. I had speculated about why the most obvious possibility that he could ransom them back to the bank. More intriguing was the thought that he wanted the information itself for his own purposes. Ooh, 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 ooh. On a, or on a similar note, maybe there was something specific that he that would be found in the midst of the paperwork, and he was willing to buy it all if it meant keeping his true intentions unclear. I'm going to be sore tomorrow, Gru groaned as he recovered from strapping the bag of papers into place. We haven't even been in a fight yet. Sore and rich, bitch spoke. I glanced at her and saw her grinning. It was disquieting. I'd only ever seen her sullen and hostile, so any smile would be kind of creepy. It was worse than that. Hers was the kind of smile you'd see from someone who had never seen one before and was trying to replicate one from what they'd read in books. Too many teeth showing. I suppressed a shiver and focused on the work. <clears throat> Give the minions a... Yeah. We... I, I, now, you see... Now you made me imagine, like, a bunch of despicable me minions on the floor during a fucking bank robbery. And now you've ruined it. <laughs> That's a horrific thought. We slid the third bag across the floor. Gru hooked it into the harness. We can't put any... Uh, we can't put any more on here without it being a problem. He decided. The weight is an e The weight is even? Bitch asked. Close enough. Bitch stood and crossed the length of the vault to where her creature walked. She rubbed her hand on Brutus' snout like you might see a horse owner do, except Brutus was most definitely not a horse. She was rubbing her hand on exposed muscle, calcified tatters of flesh and bone hooks that jutted out of her gaps and knots in the muscle. She managed to look at almost affectionate. She looked at almost affectionate as she did it. Go, baby, go, she commanded, pointing to the front door. Brutus obediently loped off to the front of the bank and just sat, his prehensile tail ab absently coiling around the door handle. Hey, bitch called out, then whistled twice, alternating between short and long. I can't, I actually can't whistle. <clears throat> Calcified tires, yeah. Yeah. Um, the smallest of the dogs was only recognizable now by her missing eye, bounded towards the, us with excitement. You know, I always wonder... I, I can't whistle. I actually physically cannot whistle. I, I cannot. I've always wondered, like, if they were to do... <laughs> the story cannot continue. Well, streams, stream ends here. Guys, thanks for joining tonight. I'm not reading anymore. That's it. Um, I've always wondered if they were ever to do, like, a worm adaptation I, I would always wonder how, what like bitches dogs would look like because it, it would probably be really hard to make them look like well no that's not true because there are plenty of like horror artists that use really well done uh, like cgi or mocap or a, a like probably insane practical effects but that's probably not going to happen these days to make things look nice and disgusting well, I wasn't thinking more like human chimeras. I was thinking more like what the thing looked like when it infected the uh, the dog, but like bigger and, and scarier. Uh, some of the hostages screamed in alarm with a sudden movement. I winced. I didn't think about the hostages. They were already heavy on my conscience, and they were constantly on the periphery of my attention. 
as long as I continue to use my bugs I planted on them to keep them alert at any moment. The one you call Angelica? I asked to distract myself. The name doesn't seem to fit with what you call the others. I didn't name her, Bitch said. As the creature approached her, Bitch slapped her a few times on the shoulder, hard. Didn't hurt the animal, no. Angelica just lashed her tail in when I realized it was a warped way of wagging her tail. Bitch snapped her fingers. That I can do. It, wow. Wow, that was... <laughs> oh, what? This is embarrassing. There we go. Um, it didn't hurt the animal, though. Angelica lashed her to the, 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 the bitch sent her fingers twice and pointed at the ground, and Angelica, Angelica sat. I had partially filled a bag when bitch rejoined me. She had previous owners then. Fuckers, bitch swore. They were the ones who made her lose an eye and an ear, I asked. What, you think I fucking did it? She dropped the, mo she dropped the money she had in her, in her and stood out, clenching her fists. Whoa, no. I protested, shifting my weight so I could move out of the way as if she if she got aggressive. Just trying to make small talk. She shook up towards me. Coward. You know you can't take me on or not. Enough! Gru shouted. Bitch turned on him, her eyes narrowing. If you can't work it out here, then take it over there. His voice was steady. Firm. Bitch spat on the floor. I'm not going to spit on my desk. And taking the offered crowbar from his hand as they passed each other. Uh, Gru took over the bag took over the bag filling where bitch had fell off we quickly got a rhythm down and four more bags were filled in a matter of minutes we want to st we want to stay to load up if if the third dog we want to stay to load up the third dog or run for it I asked Gru then added no use getting greedy I'd be happy to leave as soon as possible I wasn't interested in money and I definitely wasn't interested in going to jail for it how much do we have glanced over in Angelica's direction Tattletail answered me from what from where she stood at the door of the vault. Forty one thousand eight hundred. It looks like as much as we're going to get. The white hats are here and it's not looking good. <clears throat> we were out of the vaults in a flash, and we'd rejoined region at the front of the doors, peering through the gaps in the walls of darkness. Tattletail hasn't exaggerated. Our opposition was lined on the sidewalk across the street, the colors of their costumes bright in the midst of the gloom and the rain and gray of the city. Aegis, tan-skinned, was wearing a red, a rust-red costume with a matching helmet, both with silver-white trim and the shield emblem. The cockroach I'd come to think of him. The boy with no weak points. That's kind of horrifying if you've got, like, a human cockroach. Some terraform Mars shit. A dozen, or so, a dozen or so feet to his right was Vista, wearing a costume with a skirt all covered in, in a wavy, swoopy, swooping line that alternated between white and forest green. She had... Some body armor worked into her costume design. Her breastplate was molded to give the illusion of a chest, but that didn't really that didn't really conceal that she was still young enough that I could have kicked her ass in a straight up fist fight. If she was older than twelve, she was a late bloomer. Cock blocker, clock uh, cock blocker, clock blocker, stood to Agus's left. He wore a white costume, skin tight with interlocking panels of glossy white body armor, placed wherever they could give him protection without inhibiting his movements. I couldn't see it through the rain, but I knew that the TV that T from TV that that armor had images of clocks on it in dark gray. Some of the images on the armor were animated, so they drifted across the surface, while others were fixed in place with hands ticking. His helmet was faceless, just a smooth expan expanse of white. I always thought my stupid asshole cat jumped in the pool. <laughs> nice, very nice. <clears throat> I always thought the costumes in this. Like, the descriptions of them are really cool, too. I, I, for some reason, for the life of me, I cannot describe when I'm writing, like, armor. Like, if, if I was giving the character, like, a costume or armor, I cannot describe that for the life. I don't know if my costumes are, like, too complex or, or I just, I, I just can't do it. This may have always had trouble with. Fun fact for you. Tattletail, Gru growled in his in his echoing reverberating voice. You know how I say you're a fucking dumbass sometimes? The three weren't alone. Kidwin was floating in the air to one side of, the, of Clock Blocker. His brown hair was damp in the rain. He had a red visor and body armor in red and gold. His feet were firmly planted on his flying skateboard. What, what do we call that last time? Was it just called like a, a flyboard? It's not a skateboard. 
which had a ruby glow radiating from top to bottom. His hands were just gripping machine, were gripping matching guns, laser pistols, or something that in that vein. Kidwin was saying something to Gallant, who was standing a ways to his left. Gallant was an older teenager in a gunmetal and silver costume that blended the appearance of a pulp science fiction hero with a medieval knight. That's fucking cool. Uh, <laughs> On the opposite end of the line was someone I didn't know. He was big in a different way. Gru was big, the kind of bulk that made you think powers were at work. His muscles, his muscle-laden arms were bigger around that uh, were bigger around than my thighs, and I couldn't. And I thought he could probably crush cans between his pecs. His costume was little more than dark blue or black spandex with a diamond print. His mask was full for was full face except for the eyes and had a crystal attached to the for to the forehead. He's the only person standing there who didn't have any body armor. He didn't look like he needed it. He really needed it. Who's he? I said, pointing. Brownbeat. Tattletail sighed. He's a point blank telekinetic, which means that he can move things only with his mind, but only if they're within an inch or so of his skin. He can use it to throw punches and hit like freight trains or shield himself from incoming attacks. He's also packing personal biokinesis, which means he's got kind of an ability to ma manipulate his own body. He can heal just by concentrating on an injury, and he's used it to bulk up. If, he might be capable of doing it on the, more on the fly, but depending on how he's been trained since we, last, since we saw him last. He's been a solo hero in Brockton Bay for a little while. What the fuck is he doing here? I asked. We crossed paths with him once. Regent and Bitch beat him. Either he's out for revenge or he joined the wards very, very recently. My power is suggesting it's the latter. That's the kind of thing you're supposed to inform us well in advance, Gru hissed at her. And that, and there's not supposed to be six of them. There's seven, Telltale said, wincing as Gru slammed his fist against the wood of the door. There's someone on the roof. I'm not sure who it is, but I don't think it's Shadowstalker. Might be a member of the Protectorate. It might be a member of the Protectorate. There's not supposed to be six or seven, Gru roared in his, un in his unearthly voice. There's supposed to be three, four at most. I made an educated guess, Shaltel spoke in a low voice. I was wrong. Sue me. If we get out of this in one piece, Gru spoke, his, low, his tone low and menacing, we're going to have a long conversation. I rested my forehead against the window. An armored section of my mask blinked against the glass. Educated guess. It would have been nice if you had said it was an educated guess. Way back when we were planning this. Our Gru, bitch seems the least daunted. I can take him. Just let me all, go all out. We're not going to fucking ki we're not going to fucking risk killing anyone," Gru told her. "We're not maiming anyone either. The plan stands. We have the money. We run for it." Telltale shook her head. Oh, hold on. <clears throat> Telltale shook her head. That's what they want. Oh, 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 that's what they want. Why do you think they're lined up like that? We bolt with the money from any of the exits. The person on the roof tackles us, incapacitates us, or keeps us busy while the rest close in. Looks, look at how they're sp sort of spaced out. Just far enough apart, if we try to go between them, one of them can probably get close and fast enough to nab us before we get away. With my power, Gru started. They still outnumber us. There's at least five ways they could take one of us down with all their running, even if we go in blind. And Vista's in the equation. Figure any distance we're going to, we, we need to cover is going to be much farther away than it looks, and if things get ugly, it wouldn't be a problem if they weren't so many of them. Fuck, Regent groaned. We can't just stay here, Gru said. Sure they're getting cold and wet. Sure they're getting cold and wet, but our odds aren't much better if we face them to come... Come... Face... We force them to come in here after us. If we wait too long, the Protectorate might show up too. We have hostages, Bish said. They come here, we take out one of the... We take out one of the hostages. Someone behind us... Someone moaned. Long and loud. I think they'd heard her. Oh! What is Re? Oh, yeah, because you haven't watched like the vods. Um, Regent is is one of the members of this this gang. He's uh, his power is that he can cause like muscle spasms in people. Um, yeah, I, I guess you would be kind of lost if you weren't like if you did if you didn't have any context to what's going on. I closed my eyes and took a deep breath. It was a bad situation, and worse, I was afraid it was my fault. I'd warned Armsmaster something was going to happen. I couldn't believe he'd told the teams to be ready to go out and go out in force. Even worse, he could be the unknown person on the roof. If that was the case and Tattletail caught on, I was supremely fucked. Fuck. We need to catch them off guard. I didn't realize I was speaking aloud until the words left my breath. Sure, but how are we going to do that? Gru replied. 
You guys are masters at the gate. Or are masters at the get at the get at the, oh my god. You guys are masters at the getaway, right? So we change gears. We fight them face to face. What's awesome? That you're lost? <laughs> Oh, oh, the power to cause my region? Yeah. His power, yeah. Yeah, he's got a cool power. He's one of the cooler characters of the series. I mean, I, I can't really... I, I, I have, like, two definitive favorite worm characters. But, like, all the characters in this in this series are really, really, really good. Really, really, really well-rounded, well... Three-dimensional characters. I like them a lot. They're all They're all great. And they all have really cool powers, too. All right. <clears throat> Gru's power, he can create darkness. He, like, he sensory, he creates, like, a moving gas of sensory deprivation. And it, like, it fucks with your senses. Yeah, which is also cool. Like creating darkness. It's a nice edgy power. All right. Let us continue. I think after this chapter, I'm going to go take a break. Just for like five seconds and go to the bathroom. But until then, Agitation 3.9. I can't imagine how it looked to the wards. One moment they were standing in the rain waiting in with tense readiness. The next, the front door of the bank slammed open, revealing nothing more but total darkness. Yeah, see, there we go. Just a moment later, eight hostages came stumbling through the darkness, out of the out the doors and down the stairs. Agus's eyes opened. Agus's eyes opened wide behind his mask. He turned to look at cock, clock blocker who who gestured madly towards the ground. Turning back to the scene, Aegis bellowed. Everyone le- uh, Oh, I have to do a voice for Aegis, and I have to do- like I, I can't do, like- Chris Evans. I feel like I want to do, like, Chris Evans, Captain America. I can't do Chris Evans. I'll just have to do, like, a heroic voice. Everyone leaving the bank. Get down on the ground now. He didn't have a chance to see if they listened. Darkness swelled at the bank's entrance, and then flooded into the street like water from a broken dam. In seconds, the hostages were hidden from sight and the wards were forced to retreat several paces to keep to keep from being swallowed up. Inside the bank, Gru mused. That should, keep, that should give them a reason to think twice before blindly opening fire when they can't see. I'm liking this. Are you ready for part two? Just don't hurt the hostages, I said, glancing at the back of the 30 that were still inside. The ones we sent out are staying put? Gru asked. I felt out my power. The bugs I'd put on the hostages couldn't see or hear anything and I wasn't sensing movements. They're doing as we told them. They ran as far as they could before your power hit them, and they lay flat on the ground, hands in their heads. Then I'm going, bitch announced. She grabbed the bone spike that was jutting out of Judas's shoulder and heaved herself up to sitting up to a sitting position on his back. No, Tattletail said, grabbing bitch's foot, grabbing bitch's boot. Wait. Bitch glared down at her, clearly annoyed. That hesitation before Agus gave the order to the hostages. It didn't fit. If you figured out something, spit it out. Gru's voice. Gru spoke in his echoing voice. We need to move now before they get reorganized. Bitch, you're going after Clock Blocker. Stay away from Aegis. Got it? Bitch didn't even respond, digging her heels in Judas's side and ducking her head to avoid it hitting on the top of the door as they as they raced out. What the fuck are you doing? Gru growled. She's going. They switched costumes. Aegis is wearing Clock Blocker's costume and vice versa. I would have liked to see the expression on Brian's face, but as Gru, his mask covered everything. He turned his skull helmet back to the windows. Silent. Ice cream bottle is something, something for someone else. Ooh. Patrick, you, 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 you smuggling crack? Oh, I just doxed you on stream. I'm sorry. Mahatma, are you, are you smuggling crack? <laughs> A little late now. <laughs> I got doxed. Oh, oh god. I doxed him, I'm sorry. My bad. 
It's a good thing that there are only... Oh, there are five viewers here. Oh, shit. There's an unknown here. You get... <laughs> I doxed you in front of the unknown. Oh, no. Oopsie. Listen, I, I, I wasn't thinking. I'm sorry. Smuggling them <laughs> my prison wallet. <laughs> it dawned on me how badly that, that could have fucked us. Bitches' dogs would have attacked the person they that they thought was Aegis and gotten tagged by Clockblocker instead. In one fell swoop, he would have lost the majority of our offensive power. Catch, I told Haltel before raising my hands and directing a good portion of my bugs to drop them on the ceiling and, and flow out to the door. Taltel only grinned before she made her way back to the computer to continue her mad typing. Gru and Regent headed out to the doors, leaving Tattletail and I alone in the bank lobby. For my part, I walked to the corner of the bank and peered out through one of the tall, narrow windows by, a lo by the loan's office desk. Tendrils of Gru's darkness still clung to the window, but had a pretty decent view of the battlefield. As I watched, that view distorted, as if I was looking into a funhouse mirror or through a drop of water. The street, including the area with the darkness covering it, began swelling, broadening, and widening until two sidewalks on either side of the streets were more like semicircles than straight lines. It hurt my head to think too much about how Vista's power worked. Maybe the headache I felt looming had something to do with the fact that I was sending my bugs into the area Vista had distorted. It wasn't outside the realm of my possibility that my brain was having trouble relaying my bugs' position to me as well as it should, and the area was in the in that area was ge where geometry wasn't working as quite as well as it should. Either way, something was getting to me. I raised my hands to rub my temples, remembered my mask, and sighed, folding my arms instead. I sent my bugs through the darkness and warped space in, uh, of the street. Each time they collided with someone inside the cloud of darkness, it took me a moment to figure out who that person was. Gru was the first I ran into and the easiest to identify. Some of my bugs had tiny hairs on their bodies that could sense air currents, and the steady output of the darkness around Gru generated something like a steady air current around him. Regent was harder. I almost mistook him for a hostage, but he was wearing a hard mask over his face. I left him alone. I found the person I was looking for, bitch, and tracked her movements through darkness. Through the darkness. Imprisoning me. All that I see, absolute horror. My bugs could feel the vibrations of the dog's foot, uh, footfalls on the street, the hot, moist huffs of Judas, from Judas's nostrils, and the smells of the dog. His smell made a dozen instincts, a dozen instincts of mosquitoes and carrion flies kick into action. His scent was one of blood, meat, and gristle, the vague hint of diseased flesh. I shivered. As Bitch and her, bitch and her dogs burst from the darkness towards Aegis and Clockblocker, I had my bugs fall immediately after them. She was going straight for Clock, Clockblocker, who was dressed as Aegis. No, 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 I muttered, you idiot. The last possible second she changed course and went for the real Aegis. Aegis bolted the second dog's... At, Aegis bolted the second dog changed course, but it was too late. He tried to fly out of reach. Judas leaped nearly, nearly twice as far as high and high as I might have guessed something as big as he could. The dog's prehensile tail wrapped around Aegis's torso as they fell. Mount and rider and ensnared captive. Mount rider and ensnared captive. Bitch shouted something I couldn't hear, and Judas whipped Aegis straight down, adding the force of the throw to the monument, the momentum of the fall. I thought I might have heard the impact from the interior of the bank, or maybe it was an auditory illusion, and my bugs were the ones who heard it. Either way, Aegis hit the ground hard enough to kill an ordinary person. He wasn't down for one second before he, he was on his feet again. In the same motion he used to get on his feet, he lunged for the dog and swung a fist at Judas's snout. He might have connected, but Bitch was already steering her steed back into a cloud of darkness. She flipped Aegis the middle finger before disappearing from view. Yeah! Edgy! At the same time, Clockblocker was fighting off the bugs I'd sent out. With a fraction of a second of the bug making contact with Clockblocker or his costume, he froze it. My power simply stopped telling me where the bug was there as if they disappeared from the face of the planet. In reality, they were suspended in time, stuck in the air, immobile, untouchable. But that same power could work against him, I was thinking. I made my bugs surge forward, surrounding him, aiming to cover his entire body. I was pretty sure he couldn't disable the effects of his powers, so if he wanted to freeze all of the bugs I had crawling on him, he'd trap himself in a prison of his own making. He was good at thinking on his feet, though, or he'd faced similar late tactics before, before he had, a, he had an answer for that. Clock Blocker spun in a tight circle, freezing the bugs as his body rotated, so they were only affected when the part of his body they were on, they were on was facing away from the bank. 
the results of the cluster of bugs was left from frozen behind him, and he was free to dash straight towards Aegis. While I'd been distracted by Clockblocker, Bitch had set Brutus and Ag Angelica on Aegis. He was fending the two dogs off. The white paint of his helmet, of his helm, Clockblocker's helm, was shattered now, and his costume was torn with, in, with one piece of ruined armor, dangling by a string of cloth on his armpit. Brutus lunged towards Aegis, but he had passed over the edge of the area Vista had distorted. He fell short. The dog's jaws uh, clacked shut a foot away from Aegis's face, spittle flying. Aegis responded by slamming both fists, fingers interlaced into Brutus' snout. The dog crashed onto its side, giving Aegis the time to make fight once more, heading straight for the sky. Get it to take flight once more, heading straight for the sky. Hold on. Un momento. Okay. Angelica followed, leaping through the air just like Judas had a minute earlier. She missed and hit the side of the building hard enough to make the windows around her explode in a, pain, a spray of glass. I waited for her to fall, but she had apparently had no plans to do so. She gripped the stones, the stone of the building, and, win, and window sills around her with her claws, as with her claws, tensed and leapt and leaped again from the side of the building. If I was surprised to see the display of acrobatics from one of the dogs, I doubted there were words for what Agus must have felt just then. Angelica sees the teen hero in her jaws, and they pummeled and they plummeted together. Angelica didn't land with all four claws beneath her, and she sprawled as she hit the ground. When she stood, though, she still had Agus in Agus, one of his arms and half of his torso clasped beneath, between her teeth. She whipped him. She whipped him around like a dog might shake a toy. When she paused, he was still fighting her, slamming his free hand against the side of her head over and over. Loops and strings of drool mixed with blood hung from her mouth. At least, that's what I thought it was, from my vantage point inside the bank, peering through gloom and pouring rain. Clockblocker had slowed down as I started throwing more bugs on his way. I kept them between him and Aegis, so he, wasn't close the he wouldn't close the distance and touch the dogs. He'd responded by ducking, weaving, sprinting, spinning, and swatting or brushing them off with his hands so he could freeze them without setting barriers in his own way. Then he decided to try ignoring the swarm. I seized the opportunity to bite and sting him 20 or, 20 or so times. The surprise and pain distracted him from his evasive maneuvers, and he wound up cl clotheslining himself as he froze the insects on his face while still running forward. He went from a head, he went from a head-on run to landing on his back with his feet still in the air. I probably wouldn't have wouldn't get a better chance. I stepped the majority of the swarm on him while he was still lying on the ground. Keep them on the defensive, Brian had told me while while we sparred. Keep them guessing. Change the way you attack. Worm stops for no... It doesn't. Worm stops for no man. I directed the bugs to the area where his skin was exposed, and I piloted them into the gaps between his skin and his costume. Even with innumerable insects biting and stinging him over and over, he managed to climb to his feet and return his attempts to reach the dogs. He knew as well as I did that he couldn't freeze from now... that the He couldn't freeze them now that the bugs were made their way inside his costume. He'd have to rip his costume with his own strength if he did. I doubted that was easy for him to tear either. It was ironic. I wouldn't have been able to do this if I hadn't switched costumes with his teammate. Clockblocker's usual costume covered every inch of his skin like mine did. Probably for much of the same reason. I'm so sorry, I murmured just loud enough that I only I could hear it. I gave the bugs a new order. When the bugs started crawling up his nostrils with relentless intent, he managed to keep going, pulling himself to his feet and reassuming his efforts to freeze the bugs while advancing towards the dogs. He snorted to try cleared his nose but he, so he could keep breathing, but then he was left with the problem of needing to inhale. Oh, God, that's absolutely disgusting. I hate that. He couldn't do that without bringing bugs further into his airway, so he made the mistake of opening his, his mouth to breathe. When a mass of bugs forced themselves into his open mouth, he staggered and fell. I think he was gagging, but he couldn't see or hear well enough to, from my vantage point to tell. At my instruction, more bugs forced themselves under gaps in his costume and into his ear canals. Yet others, small ones, crawled around his eyes, using deceptive strength to try and force them in between other his eyelids. Oh, God. I couldn't imagine what that felt like to him. I, I can't imagine what it felt like to me either. Yeah. God. Uh, everyone had probably experienced the sensation of having a bug crawling on them, but these bugs were uh, operating with a human intelligence backing them up to penetrate his eyes, ears, nose, and mouth. 
They were working together with a single-minded purpose, in, instead of mindlessly crawling where their instincts directed them. I don't know if I was calculated or something he did in a moment's panic, but he used his power. Every bug was touching him disappeared from my reach. Once I'd realized what he'd done, I pulled away every bug that wasn't affected. I didn't want to suffocate him, and he'd effectively pinned himself in the street with his power. The worst thing that could happen now was he'd panic and throw up, choking on his own puke. I could do my part to avoid that. I'd won. I wasn't sure how to feel. I was kind of... I, I felt the kind of elation mixed with the quiet horror of what I'd just done to a superhero. I could settle that inner turmoil and decided on way to make amends to Clark Blocker another, at another time. There were still five wards and a stranger on the rooftop to be taken out if I wanted to stay out of jail. Um, I don't think... I don't think she feels bad if the bugs die, because, like, she's probably just had so many of them that, you know, a, a, a singular bug dying would probably really wouldn't matter to her. Tinker has had a stroke. <laughs> I, I overregistered thy spontaneity at the moment. <laughs> Maybe. <clears throat> Cool, we're making actually really good time tonight. We might actually do some of uh, Act 4. Or Arc 4. I keep calling... I keep changing between Arc and Act. Yeah. We might do some of Act 4 tonight. You know what? After this one, we'll take a break. After this one. <clears throat> Pee pee a pee pee break. Not yet. Don't don't think about taking a piss yet. Not yet. Don't you dare. Worm stops for no man, except when I say so. Don't you dare think about taking a piss break yet. Next chapter we take a piss break. Don't even think about pissing. When you fucking dare, or I will find you. I know who you are. Don't. Don't. Agitation 3.10. Six good guys were still in action, as far as I knew. Clock blocker was down and posed no threat unless someone walked into his reach, where, where he was lying down. Or unless we took longer than a, than a ten or so minutes it would have for his power to release him. Angelica and Brutus were playing a game of macabre game uh, we're playing a macabre game of tug of war using angus as the rope <laughs> the rest of the battlefield was was chaos patches of darkness covered everything and the landscape was distorted in some areas vista had warped the rain wasn't falling in a straight line can you imagine how fucking cool that power would be that's uh that that depends on how you look at it you can look at it as a threat or you can look at it as a promise i'll come hang out with you whatever you want Whatever you'd like. One spot in particular had rain moving horizontally before it dropped to help fill a massive puddle 30 feet across where her power had made an indent in the ground. That's such a fucking... I, I, Vista easily has like one of my favorite powers of the entire story. Easy. So fucking cool. Aegis and Clockblocker were more or less dealt with, as Vista was last remaining, uh, was last re remaining priority target. I directed my remaining swarm towards her. They wouldn't reach her quickly, though, and rain bogged them down in both puddles and distorted space for forced a more roundabout route for bugs. Bitch, still riding Judas, came rushing out of a cloud of darkness, splashing through the huge puddle. Kidwin and Gallon opened fire on her with laser beams and painfully bright blasts of energy. She was moving fat. Oh my god. She was moving fast and unpredictably enough that Judas only took one or two glancing hits. The distance between her and Vista rapidly closed. Vista raised her hand, the surface of the street bulged up to upwards towards a short wall. As it grew, the wall caught one of Judas's forepaws, tripping him. He fell, and his rider was sent tumbling head over heels. She she distorts, um, like, reality. So she can just, like, 
Like she could, like the example they give is like she can just pull two sidewalks together just to form one big like. Or she can like make buildings grow or, or expand. It's really cool. It's really 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 cool. Um, here you'll you'll see you'll see more do her do her thing. <clears throat> Bitch got to her feet before Judas did, but only managed to take a single step before one of Gallant's blasts clipped her. I winced. His light blasts, were, light blasts were charged with energy that made people struck feel a particular emotion. Gallon couldn't blast you with one that made you feel hopeless, scared, sad, ashamed. Bitch screamed. It was a long and primal noise filled with rage. I was still inside the bank, watching things unfold at the window, barely able to hear it, and made my skin crawl. So he'd shot a dangerous psychopath a blast that made her angry. Someone would have to explain that one to me at a later date. Writhing, still screaming, she pointed at Gallon. Apparently that was order enough because Judas charged at the teenager that was dressed like a science a science fiction Lancelot. That's fucking cool. That's fucking cool. If I had a costume, I'd want it to be that. That's fucking cool. Bitch didn't attack him, though. Without her dogs at her back, essentially without her power, she went straight for Vista. She was focused enough to stay on priority target. Vista was ready, though. As Bitch tried to close the distance, the roadway between her and the young heroine stretched, uh, stretched out until a distance she had to cover was two, three, four, five times as far. Vista then pinched the space between their clothes together, crossed a third of a block with a single skip, and then returned it to normal. I swore under my breath, and not just because my bugs had felt a lot more dist distance to travel. My heart was pounding again. It was, essentially, it was getting steadily worse. Was someone's power at work giving me a headache? There wasn't anyone in the wards I was pretty sure who could mess with your head like that. Gallon could mess with your emotions, but he had to hit you with the light blast to do it. The person on the roof, then. I was fairly certain there wasn't anyone in the protectorate or new wave who could affect me like this. Bitch gave up on Vista and whistled for Judas. The dog responded immediately, abandoning his skirmish with Gallon, who was trying to fail, uh, who was failing a stand, failing to stand. A wash of darkness consumed him before he managed to pick himself up. Kidwin opened fire on Bitch as her dog returned to her. Given the excessive distance between them, it would have been a hard shot to make bef make before Vista stretched the area and Bitch was standing on, meaning his arm was wildly off target. His aim was wildly off target. He stopped, changing a setting and fired a fresh salvo. This time lasers came out in more of a staccato spray like you'd expect from a machine gun. One of the lasers caught Bitch in the center of her stomach and laid her flat. Judas guarded her owner by hunkering over her, blocking further shots and obscuring my view of her. Near Vista, a large figure staggered out of the darkness, Shadow still clinging to him, bellowing a scream and screaming incoherently about bugs. He thrashed for a moment, then collapsed into a heap a short distance from Vista. Someone that large could only be... Uh, browbeat. Vista apparently reached the same conclusion I did before she took a few steps closer to him, looking around helplessly for a way to help him. An instant after I realized I didn't actually have bugs on Browbeat, the, vic the figure struck Vista across the side of the head, laying her flat. I saw a brief glimpse of Gru's skull mask before, before he and Vista were both covered by a fresh tide of darkness. Bitch, Vista, Clock Blocker, and Gallon out of action, I think. I called across from the Tattletale, who was hammering away at a keyboard. We've got Aegis Handler for the time being. Not sure what happened to Browby, but that's but there's only him, Kidwin, and the person on the roof to deal with now. We can make a break for it soon. One last thing to do, Tattletale grinned to me. I'll be right back. Keep an eye on things here. What? No! Tattletale! Damn it! I shouted. He was already running heading to the uh, to the offices that we'd been through on our way to the bank. I didn't have enough time to dwell on her leaving. Flickers of light outside bank caught my attention. Kidwin was flying 15 feet above the ground in his hoverboard. You see, there it is! It's a hoverboard! In front of him, pieces of a massive device were materializing, shimmering into existence like you saw on the transporters on Star Trek. It was only one or two steps away from being complete, but you could tell what it was. A gun, no less than 15 feet long, with a barrel three or four feet across. All turret mounted on a circular platform, not unlike the board he was riding. Hold on, I gotta sneeze. It's coming. <coughs> there we go. Shit, I whispered to myself. I set my bugs after him. He swiveled the cannon around to face Judas, who was still guarding the spot where Bitch had fallen. 
A bolt of lightning er a bolt of light erupted from the cannon and sent Judas flying beyond any of my field of vision. He fired another shot at another greater distance, presumably at the fallen dog. Then he swiveled and fired two more shots in quick, quick succession, blasting Agus and the two dogs that were gripping him. The dogs and Agus were all sent flying into the walls of the office, building opposite the bank. While the dogs didn't get up any attention, a bloody and, fall and tattered Agus on his feet in an instant in the air moments later. He got to a good height, maybe two or three stories up, and stayed there, like, likely to get his bearings and survey the situation. As my bugs approached the kid, he took notice and maneuvered his cannon to decimate the swarm. I spread them out, but he simply pulled a lever and released a flamethrower-like blast of lightning and sparks, eliminating virtually all of the bugs I had sent out into the street. The scant few that remained I sent towards his face to crawl beneath the visor into his nose and mouth. It wasn't enough. Then kid went in the cannon straight for me. I jumped to cover the moment to for cover the moment that he realized what I realized what he was doing. There was a muffled sound, more 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 a very large person so, what? There was a muffled sound, more a very large person someone hitting a punching bag than what I'd expected a laser cannon to sound like. And the window exploded. That was a weird sentence. What was he doing? We had hostages inside. I turned to check and saw there weren't any hostages near me. Did he know that? Heat sensors in his visor? Was someone watching me through the camera and passing him passing him info? Damn it. There was too much I didn't know, and Telltale wasn't around to fill me in. Gru sprinted between two clouds of darkness, raising one hand to send a blast of his power towards Kid Wynn, observing the kid's line of sight. Kidwin responded by ponderously maneuvering himself and the cannon out of the top of the clouds of dark out of the top of the clouds of darkness. I swore under my breath and sent a command for more bugs I had inside to drop the ceiling and go outside the attack. There were a few more bugs near the clock near clock blocker who had gotten free of the time stopping effect he'd laid on them. I had added those to the assault. My legs buckled as my headache worsened tenfold, worse than the response to my bugs were sluggish like I ordered them to move through mud. I felt a momentary panic, but there wasn't really anything I could do. I gripped my teeth and ordered the attack anyway, then forcing my, then forced myself to run to the other side of the bank in case he could somehow detect me and shoot through the walls to hit me. <laughs> I glanced through the window for Agus as I passed them. Through the rain and the darkness that lingered on the surface of the window, I spotted him. His white costume was wet with rain and ridiculous amounts of blood, and he was diving straight for the bank like a human missile. Damn it. Inexplicably, his descent, his descent wavered, then curved. He flew straight into the ground full, full force, hard enough to crack pavement. One of the dogs, I couldn't tell which, had managed to et extricate itself from the rubble of the shattered wall and rushed at the fallen Aegis. Kidwin was occupied to do three things at once. He was maneuvering out of the way of the clouds of darkness. Gru was settling in his territory, in his way, territory. I can't, I can't read. Making them. Making return pot shots at Gru as Gru zigzagged between the shot the spots of cover with every free moment. He was blasting hundreds of my bugs out of the air. If my power was at full strength, my bugs probably would have reached him slowly. But something was inter interfering. That or I'd overexerted myself. Bugs were slowly slow to react, slow to move, and some were slipping through my grasp, returning to their indistinctive behavior. Making matters worse, I wasn't blind to the fact that every time I gave the command, my headache got exponentially worse. When Kid went occupied as he was, with Kim went occupied as he was, the dog made a clear path towards Aegis. Aegis didn't try to run this time. He stood his ground and reached for his utility belt. He retrieved something that looked like a, mi a miniature fire extinguisher. Then he pulled the pen. For the second in a matter of minutes, I dove away from the window. It wouldn't be a grenade, but the option that made the most sense. I squeezed my eyes shut and covered my ears just in time. The explosion the flashbang grenade made me made was enough to leave me breathless, and there was a stone and wall and some fifty or so feet between us. I chanced a careful look through the window as soon as I had recovered, hands over my ears. The dog was reeling, making pain sounds and Agus pummeling it, using his flight to close the distance and add some more momentum to his swings. When the dog Angelica I saw looked like it was starting to recover, he grabbed two more flashbang grenades from his belt with one hand and pulled the pins with the other, dropping them to the ground just below him. I ducked behind the cover again, but they didn't go off. When I changed another, when I chanced another look, I saw the tables had turned. When the flashbangs had been dropped, there was a smudge of Gru's darkness covering the ground. Angelica was having it out with Aegis, and Regent was striding out of the darkness in Kidwin's direction. I'd forgotten about Regent. 
it made sense that he was working from a, a, a discreet position like I was. He probably would have been the one to alter Aegis' flight path. Seeing Regent's approach, Kidwin turned his turret-mounted cannon in his direction. Before he could fire, though, Regent raised two fingers and Kidwin lost his footing on his flying skateboard. The cannon shifted until it was pointing straight up as a young hero dangled from the handles, his weight altering the, tra the trajectory of the cannon. His board clattered to the ground as a, a few feet away. Regent made a dismissive wave and Kidwin let go with one hand, his fingers and arm curling backwards as in a palsied fit. Regent repeated the gesture, and Kidwin lost his grip on the controls, dropping a good 20 feet to, to the asphalt. As Regent approached to stand over him, Kidwin reached for the laser pistol. He scowled in frustration as his fingers continued to twitch and curl involuntarily, instead of closing on the handle of the gun. With an almost relaxed air, Regent shoved the end of his taser into Kidwin's side. I don't know if it was a sense of relief, but I couldn't help but laugh as Regent collect, collected the fallen skateboard and began a wobbly ascent to the floating cannon turret. He aimed and began firing at Aegis, who was forced to scramble out of his way. What's so funny, Psycho? I whirled around to the face and saw the freckle of the brown-haired hostage that had been glaring at me when he would first taken control of the bank lobby. After that, I saw the only stars as she, I saw only stars as she slammed something large and blunt to the side of my head. Member from the interlude chapter? It's a familiar character. All right, I'm gonna take a a, a whiz. Uh, use this time to go get yourself some snacks, some more water, whatever you want to drink. Uh, I'll be back soon.
Alrighty. Everyone ready to go? Oh my god, we're at seven viewers! Holy shit! Hey everyone, welcome! Wow! Look at us go! Yeah, Pog's in the chat, boys. Fucking awesome. Which one of you made some multiple accounts? Seven viewers, Pog? Hell yeah. Awesome. Really awesome. Hey, welcome everyone. Get yourselves nice and comfy. We're finishing up arc three of Worm. Um, yeah, we're making really good time on this, so I'm probably gonna do... I just want to see how long arc four is. Hold on. Um, arc four is, oh, arc four has two interludes. We'll do some of arc four tonight. I can't guarantee we're going to do half of it tonight, but we can, we can do some of it tonight. All right. Let's get back into worm. Agitation 3.11. I crash into the office chair behind me, and both the chair uh, and both the chair and I topple to the ground. The armor of my mask had taken the worst of the hit, but it still hurt as much as anything I'd ever experienced. The girl glowered at me from the, her mop of frizzy brown hair. In her hands, she was gripping a fire extinguisher. Behind her, past light that were flickering across the field of vision, I could see the hostage streaming upstairs. It was disorienting because the bugs I had left on, on them were telling me they were still in the corner of the lobby, staying still. I could feel one spider shift slightly as the person it was riding exhaled, then shuddered a little. Even as I saw the same person stumbling and nearly falling on the stairs in their haste to get away. I reached for their bugs, tried to tell one to move, and everything went exactly wrong. There were no words that to describe it exactly. It was like feedback. If my brain had been a computer, I got to the feeling I'd only get hundreds or thousands of error messages popping up across the screen. It was painful, too, just compounding until it felt like my brain was being used as a punching bag. I pressed my head to my hand, wincing in pain, and it just wasn't from being bludgeoned with a fire extinguisher. The headache was a near migraine level now, and I would desperately want to tear off my mask and try to throw up, if only, relieve, if, if the only, if only to relieve the nausea that was welling up. I was getting an idea of why I'd been feeling so off. What the fuck did you do? I asked the girl. You don't need, you don't need to know that. She swung the fire extinguisher over, over her head at me, and I scrambled out of my way, grabbing the edge of a table to haul myself as, to my feet as I did it. She didn't chase me. Instead, she reached into her jacket pocket and retrieved a cell phone. She started to punch a number into a keypad with one hand, and then other, then other holding a fire extinguisher. Her eyes were trained on me. There was no way I was going to tell, let her make the, make the phone call, whatever, whoever she was dialing. I was on the offense, lunging towards her as I re reached into the armor, armored component at my back and retrieved the extend extendable baton. I pulled the trigger and flicked it out on one side. Eighteen inches of black painted alloy with a weight tip snapped out from the foam grip handle. Her eyes widened as I swung the baton, but she had the presence of mind to drop the phone and heft the fire extinguisher up to block, up to block the attack. Her grip, on fire, her grip on the fire extinguisher wasn't good enough for her to keep hold of it, so it clattered to the ground. She backed away rather than trying to risk, it, risk picking up again. The girl retreated as I advanced towards her. I stopped when I was standing over her cell phone. I collapsed and sheathed the baton, then bent down and retrieved the fire extinguisher. I smashed the phone with the butt end of it. Shit, I like that phone, she muttered. Shut up, I retorted, with pain making my voice strained, harder edged. What the fuck did you do to me? I pressed the heel of my free hand against my forehead as if pressure could st help stave off the pain. I don't think I'll tell you. Who the fuck are you and who are you trying to call? Actually, it was a text, not a call, and it went through, she said. Then she smiled at me. The same moment I uttered the word who, one of the windows of the bank windows shattered. A blur of white and gold slammed into the center of the lobby hard enough to send fragments of marble like skit marble tiles skittering over the head to my feet halfway across the room. The figure straightened, dusted herself off, and turned to glare at me. Almost casually, she back-ended the marble and oak table to her left that held off at the withdrawal and deposit, slits, deposit slips. 
The lazy swing of her arm, she annihilated the table, doing so much damage that nobody would ever be able to put it back together again. It's humiliating to admit, but I nearly wet myself. I'm not sure my reaction would have been so much different if she didn't have the power that made her flat out terrifying. Literally, that's what her power did. Had I done something heinous in a past life to deserve going up against Lung on my first time in costume and Glory Girl on my second? Hey, sis. Glory Girl lifted her head to one side to look at the brown-haired girl. You okay? The girl, who could be none other than Amy Dallin, Pansia when she was in costume, offered Glory Girl a beaming smile. I am now. Glory Girl's sister had been among the hostages. Damn it. At least I knew who she was now. She could heal with a touch, and if what she'd done to my powers was any indication... That wasn't the full extent of her abilities. Glory Girl and Pansia were celebrities, even if the Pansia had generally avoided the spotlight of fate. As of late. Spotlight of fate. <laughs> they were among the most famous of local heroes, arguably among the most powerful of the kid capes. And then they were pissed at me, and I was stuck in a room with them. My powers weren't working. Glory Girl stepped towards me as I scrambled for Pansia. She scrab scrabbled for a grip on my costume, trying to grab at my glove, then at my mask. But the moment I drew my knife, both she and Glory Girl went absolutely still. I grabbed Pansia's chin and maneuvered so I was standing behind her, my knife thrust to her throat. Her throat? Oh my god. Glory Girl and her, Glor Glory Girl and her sister Panacotta, yeah. Consider yourself lucky, bug bitch. Or that costume cover that costume covers your entire body, Pansia murmured to me. Maybe I'd give you heart maybe I'd give you a heart attack or cancer. I swallowed hard. It wasn't counting myself as particularly lucky at this point. It seems to be, it seems we have a stalemate, Glory Girl said. True, I replied. So, are we going to just stand here until reinforcements arrive for one side or another, or tip the scales in someone's favor? I could live with that. Last I saw, my side was winning. I helped Agus out of a jam on my way in, so he's keeping your little friends busy. You should already know the Protectorate is on their way from a wine and dine in the Brockton Bay's finest at the Augustus Country Club. Can't speak for them, but I'd know they'd be royally pissed if some some snots dragged me away from a chance to have the club's chocolate mousse. Pansia made a little laugh. It is good, isn't it? Then in a lower voice she whispered to me, What if I fucked up your taste buds, you little terrorist? You threaten the lives of innocence. Lives of innocence? I can go that far. I can do anything with your biology. Make everything you eat taste like bile. Maybe I'll make you fat. Morbidly, disgustingly fat. You can shut up now. Tighten the grip and pressed the knife a fraction harder against her throat. Between the stress of the moment, that pounding headache, and the fact that fucking Glory Girl was standing not fifty feet away from not fifty feet away from me, I didn't feel like I didn't need little sister distracting me with nightmarish imagery. Glory Girl spoke up. It's not just the, the protect it's not just the protectorate either. You just took a member of the New Wave hostage, threatened her life. It's a pretty damn good change my chance my mom, dad, aunt, and uncle and cousins will be showing up too. Brandish, Flashbang, Lady Photon, Manpower, Laser Dream, Shielder. How are you going to manage them? How are you going to manage then? Fuck. I had no reply to that. I kept my mouth shut. I was barely able to focus now as my head throbbed. My vision was wavering around the edges. My grip on my bugs was virtually gone. Most had freed themselves from my influence entirely and were buzzing around the light, light fixtures or crawling for darkness. It was all I could do to stay, standing and keeping my, sta my hands steady. Drop the knife and surrender, and I'll make sure you get leniency. I've read up on law enough to know you don't have power to make that power to make any deals, I said. No go. Okay, then I guess we wait. A few long moments passed. <laughs> Glory Girl turned her attention to her sister. I wanted to go to the mall for lunch, but no, Glory Girl said, you need to go to the bank. It was either going to the bank or wind up broke for that double date you're forcing me into. Ames, the guy I'm setting up with is a 16-year-old millionaire. Uh, <laughs> Ooh, I think you, I think, I think uh, we dodged a bullet here. I don't think it's unreasonable to expect him to foot the bill for dinner in a movie. Could you two please shut up? I growled. Do they have to? It's all very informative. Telltale joke that she slid into the room. She holstered herself to the edge of one of the teller's stations and greeted Glory Girl. Hey, Glory Hull. Glory Girl's face twitched. Hey, Telltale. I called out, my voice a touch strained. Not that I'm not glad to see you, but could you avoid antagonizing Alexandria Jr.? Ah, you made things under control. Why not set the bugs on the prom queen? Prom queen? Glory Girl asked. Um, I cut in. Before either of them could say anything and started a fight. 
First of all, she's invincible. Second, again, bad idea to irritate someone who can swing a, a school bus like a baseball bat. Third, my hostage did something to fuck with my powers. Glory hole on her sister Panacotta, yeah. <laughs> that last bit sucked, Telltale sympathized. Then she took a closer look at Pansia. Shit, Amy Dallin? Gru's gonna kill me for missing that. You look different when you than you did when you were showing up on the news. Are you wearing your hair differently? Tattletail hijacked it again. Less small talk, more problem solving. Glory go on the protectorate, and maybe New Wave are on the mo are on the route. Are on route. Jesus. <laughs> Tattletail glanced at Glory Girl, then frowned. She's not lying. Let's start with problem three. Since you since you're not looking so hot, your powers aren't working. Can't control my can't control my bugs. Got a major headache. Think I know why? Let me fix that for you. Tattletail said. She hopped down from the teller station and started to walk towards me and Pansia. Don't move, Glory Girl war warned. Or what? Telltale whirled to face the girl, smiling. You'll beat me up? You can't do anything with my teammate has a knife at your sister's throat. Sit. Stay. Good girl. Glory Girl glowered at, te at Tattletale, but she didn't move. I think it would be better if you stayed back, I warned her. You get in Pansia's reach, she'll touch you and give you a stroke or something. <laughs> Can she? Sure. Will she? Definitely not. She's all bark, no bite. Try me, Pansia taunted. I reasserted my grip and reminded her of the knife against her throat. I'd really prefer to avoid tempting fate, I said carefully. Fine, fine, Telltale said, raising her hands in a placating gesture. She walked over to the branch manager's desk and opened a drawer. You pull a gun, at, you pull a gun out of that drawer, tell, girl girl threatened, and I'll fucking break you. Enough with enough with threats you can't follow up on. It's not a gun, Telltale grinned, raising her hands again. A keychain dangled from her thumb. Keys, Glory Girl said. The keys of the manager, Jeffrey Clayton. Type A personality, total control freak. The guy and the guy the kind of guy who loves to have absolute control over a meeting. First of all, who cares? Second, how do you know this? Come on, Telltale smiled, folding her arms. Villain one oh one. Don't give the info to a hero who is in a gloating monologue. <laughs> right, Glory Girl agreed. Always worth a try. I'll tell you anyways. Glory Girl raised an eyebrow. No reason not to. Actually, my advantage to let you know. I'm psychic. I read his mind when he had when he when we had him hostage. Like I'm reading yours right now. The light was so smooth I almost believed it. A red of, a red of a flash of red caught my attention. The red dot from a laser pointer settled on the hood of Pansia's jacket. I looked at Tattletail and saw that while she had her arms folded, she was holding a laser pointer that attached directly to the keychain. I watched Tattletail draw a lazy circle around the spot she'd pointed to on Pansia's jacket. Bullshit, Glory Girl said. The brain power you need to interpret and decode someone's unique neural patterns would need a head five times the usual size to contain it all. True psychics don't, can't exist. Ooh, someone's taking Parahumans 101 at the university. Your parents pulled some strings, got you into a university course before you were done with high school? I think you already know the answer. I'm not buying that you just read my mind to get it. Why so hard to believe? Legend can shoot lasers from his hands. Lasers that can turn corners. Clock Blocker and Vista can mess with the fundamental forces of space and time. Kaiser can read, create metal from thin air. Conservation of mass. Converting of energy. Basic laws of our universe that get broken by capes all the time. All that is possible, but I can't peek into your brain. Telltale was still focused on the laser pointer on Pansia's hood. Since I was the only person in a position to see it, I could only be for my benefit. I pulled the hood back, investigating the interior, and found nothing. But on the nape of her neck, I spotted one of my Black Widow spiders. I pulled it off of her gently and felt the pain in my head worsen with the contact, the movement. Either by impulse or by reflex, as I flinched at the pain, I crushed it between my fingers. Immediately, the pain in my head dropped to a fraction of what it had been. The relief was so intense it was almost euphoric. I didn't fully grasp what Pansia had done, but I was getting a pretty good picture of it. She'd somehow sensed that I was do what I was doing to control the spiders, then altered things so the spider wasn't sending me the right information. A, con a continuous loop of wrong information. Like when thieves in the movie splice the video camera feed to repeat the same segment over and over. Does that, does that happen? Does that happen very often? I don't know. Either by accident or design, it had exponentially increased the inter interference every time my power I reached into the ar arachnids in question all building up to a metaphorical short circuit of my power. I could barely fathom the, sub the subtleties and delicacy that would have been required to set up. 
Glory G- Tensia began to speak, but I tightened my grip, and she closed her mouth. Shh! I hissed at her. Scholars say you're wrong. Telltale grinned. Scholars want me to be wrong, and their research reflects that. Telepathy scares the elven crap out of people, especially since their only suspected telepath out there is the Simurg. <laughs> Glory Girl finished for her. <clears throat> right, and when a fucking Endbringer is your precedent, people get spooked, just like you're spooked right now, at the idea that there's someone standing in front of you who can find out your deepest, darker secrets and tell the world. Telltale was pointing to Pansia's upper arm now. It took me two tries to murder the spider. Before I'd finished, Telltale was erecting me to the final one, which I'd slashed on Pansia's ankle. I killed it by jabbing it with my toe. The headache was completely gone a second later. Which is why you call yourself Tattletail. I see, Glory Girl was saying. But you're a retard. We're part of the new wave. We have no secrets. That's the whole fucking point of our team. Heroes with no secret identities, no secrets, full disclosure, total accountability. For the record, Tattletail said, her voice smooth and calm, I fucking hate it when people call me stupid. Yet, here the two of you are. Neither of you have powers that work against us. All you've got is a knife, and if you use it, you both die in, a mo in the most painful way I can think to, I think I can think to get away with. Oh, honey, now who's being stupid? I've got the most powerful weapon of them all. Telltale purred, smiling, wicker smiling wickedly. Information. Last chapter. Last chapter of arc four. Arc, arc three, I mean. Sorry. I should have left this bottle to get warm. Whatever, cold water. It's not as good for your throat as warm water is. Whatever. I did it last time. It didn't really seem to help, but whatever. We're still at seven viewers. That's fucking rad. Cool, cool. Informa uh, uh, agitation. I, I always do that. I don't read the fucking chapter titles. Jesus. Agitation 3.12. Information, Glory Girl repeated. Tattletail twirled the keys around one of her fingers. For instance, it's not exactly public knowledge that, that Pansia was adopted. It's not a secret either. It's an unofficial record. Falsified records, Tattletail grinned. Glory Girl glanced at her sister. That is that is hard. Glory Girl glanced at her sister. That is hard to say. Let me tell you a little. Let me tell you a little story. Correct me if I'm wrong on any of the details. Eleven years ago, just five years after Cape Zoe started showing up, there was a team of operating he hereabouts, calling themselves the Brockton Bay Brigade. Lady Photon, Manpower, Brandish, Flashbang, Fleur, and Lightstar. They, wa they wind up taking on a villain in his home, and it's a pretty decent fight. They beat him, and because he was a real bastard, he got sent to the straight to the birdcage. Stop now, Gorgel said. Point made. Oh, I haven't even gotten to the point. See, they found a little girl hiding in the closet. His little girl, a toddler, Telltale grinned at Pansia. Given the odds that someone with powers would have a kid with powers, and knowing how little, a little girl would never be able to have a normal life with, with word inevitably going, getting out about her past, they're going to taking her in. We already know this story already, Gorgel replied, her tone just a touch testy. Whenever Telltale was doing, I sensed that it would give us more control over the situation. I commented, this is new to me, I'm sort of intrigued. The point I'm getting at, Glory Hole, is that I know that one detail you don't. Well, one detail you two don't. Or at least, I'm willing to look at all the little clues you've got floating around in your heads and figure out the one thing you've gone out of your way to avoid knowing. Glory Hole's curious, but she avoids the subject because her sister desperately wants to, and Pansia, well, if I told her, I suspect she'd do something very stupid. I could feel Pansia slump in my arms. That fight had gone, the fight had gone out of her. So, Amy, you want to know who your daddy is? For a few moments, there was only the sounds of rain pattering against the, winds, the winds, windowsill and the buzzing of insects still in the room. It's that bad? I asked in a half whisper, as much to Pansy as I did to Tattletail. It's not the man that would bother her so much. It's the knowing. Every hour of every day after hearing me say his name, she would wonder. She's terrified she'll start second-guessing every part of herself, wondering if she's inherited it from him or if she was that way out of an unconscious desire not to be him, knowing as much as she'd done already to keep her awake at some nights, but knowing his name, knowing who he is and what he did, for the rest of her life she would compare himself to him. 
Compare herself to him. Isn't that right, Amy? Shut up. Just shut up. Pansy retorted, her voice thick with emotion. Why? I'm on a roll. That's not the most dangerous tidbit of info I picked up here. I know stuff that's just as bad. I saw a flicker of doubt come across Glory Girl's face. I'll make you a deal, Glory Hole. You go to the vault, lock yourself in, and don't speak on the subject. I won't say that one sentence that tears your family apart. Glory Girl clenched her fists. I can't do that. I'm calling your bluff, and if I'm wrong, I'll face the consequences of whatever you say. Very principal. Very self-involved, too. That you think the secret and the consequences have to do with you and your overzealous nature. They don't. They have to do with her. Telltale directed her laser pointer at Pansia's forehead. You won't be tickled pink, either. But the aftermath with hers would be hers to deal with. Humiliation, shame, heartbreak. I could feel Pansia stiffen in my grip. Offer stands, Telltale grinned. The next twelve seconds, get in the vault. You're full of shit, Pansia spat the words. Then why are you so tense, I asked. Eight seconds. Pansia abruptly tore out of my grip, so violently I had to pull the knife away to keep her from cutting her own throat against it. Telltale scrambled to put a desk between her and Pansia, but Glory Girl slammed into her, carrying her across the length of the room. They stopped just short of the wall, not that Telltale got away unscathed. Glory Girl shoved Telltale into, Telltale into the wall, one hand over her mouth, and held her there. While Pansia was distracted, I pressed my knife into the left, into my left hand and gripped the baton. I pressed the trigger while swinging it, letting the momentum of the swing draw it out to its full length. Pansia saw me coming, but I don't know if she realized what I was holding. A length of metal struck her across the side of her head. She staggered a few feet, then went down hard. Unfortunately for me, Glory Girl saw it all unfold. Nobody fucks with my family, she shouted, and her power was cranked out full bore. My knees turned to jelly and my brain just gave up on rational thought. Glory Girl threw Tattletale at me like a very strong child might throw a rag doll, and I just stood there like a deer in headlights. Tattletale's body collided with my midsection, knocking the wind out of me. The two of us collided with a desk, sending a monitor and a plastic box of files to the floor. Paper and fragments of monitors scattered, scattered all over the ground. We were still reeling when Glory Girl start, started floating towards us. I was struggling, unsuccessfully to heave wheezing gasps of air into my lungs while Telltale was gripping one of her arms tight around her body, making little whimpering noises. I'm going to pull in every favor I'm owed and put myself in debt with local DA and whoever else I have to to get you both sent to the birdcage, Glory Girl, Glory Girl promised. You know what that place is like? A prison without wardens. No communication with the outside world. No escape yet which is pretty amazing considering it houses all of the world's most world's and most powerful villains we've been able to capture. We don't, even know, we don't even know for sure if anyone's still alive inside there. Just a bucket where we dump scum like you, so you never have to worry about We never have to worry about you again. Bugs, Telltale grunted at me, almost too quiet to hear. I didn't catch her meaning. I was still struggling to catch my breath, so I just, st I just shook my head at her. And no contact with the outside world means you don't go fucking talking about Amy whenever... And whatever Amy wants to keep private. I trust my sister. I trust she has a reason for keeping it to herself. Bugs, swarm her. Telltale said, talking, taking lots of little breaths as she said it. I caught her meaning. I reached for my swarm and I was glad to find that my power was working perfectly. Pansia's sabotage job had been undone when I'd killed the last of the three spiders. I set every bug I could reach on Glory Girl. Useless. I felt like I, I'd set them on unnaturally strong, slick glass. Idiots, Glory Girl muffled. Glory Girl's muffled voice came from the midst of the cloud of insects. I'm invincible! Tattletail used her good arm to prop herself up, groaning. First of all, I warned you about calling me stupid. Second, no, you're not invincible. Not exactly. Then she raised her good hand from her belt and trained a small handgun on Glory Girl. The sound was deafening. You don't really get a sense for how intense gunfire is from TV and movies. As is, it was, lo it was enough that it took me a few seconds to just get a grip. Just a heartbeat later, I realized my bugs had broken through. They found flesh to latch on, flesh to bite, sting, claw, and puncture. Glory Girl dropped like a stone and started thrashing violently. Help me stand, Telltale's voice was strained. Using my power like that took a lot out of me. I grabbed her good hand and helped her up. With one of her arms around my shoulders, we hurried back out of the bank together. She shoved the gun into one of the largest pouches of the belt. What? I tried, but talking just sent me into a spasm of painful coughs. We were down the front steps of the bank before I felt like trying again. What just happened? 
She's not really invincible. That's just an idea she likes to put in people's heads. She has a force, a force field around her entire body, but it, sh it shorts out whenever she takes a good hit. Comes back online a few seconds later. I know when I saw she had one... When I know I knew when I saw she had dust on her costume. Just that her force field would have would kept off her. Fuck, this hurts. What is it? She pulled my arm out of my socket when she threw me. Can you fix a dislocated shoulder? I shook my head. I knew how, generally speaking, from first aid classes I'd taken, but I doubted I had the strength to manage it. I didn't want to waste telltales... I didn't want to waste time getting Telltale in a good position to fix her arm when we need to when we need to be gone. The fight outside the bank was still going our way. Only Agus was still in action. He was hemmed by three dogs in Regent's borrowed laser cannon. Groove stepped out of the darkness near me, holding onto bitches much much the same way as I was holding Tattletail. Let's scram, I said. Let's. He agreed. Oh, oh, that's that's Groove. Let's. He agreed in a haunting voice. Hey, G man, Telltale wins. Pop my shoulder back in. Groove nodded. I helped brace Tattletail as, as he shoved her arm back into back into place. He asked, "What happened?" "The glory go on the roof," I explained. Then I coughed painfully a few times before adding, "Can you please get the Can we please get the fuck out of here?" "You guys took on Glory Girl?" Gru asked, incredulous, while Bitch roused herself enough to whistle for her dogs. "In a sense," Tattletail replied. At the same time, I nervously pointed out, "She could be coming us after us any second." We got on the dogs, and Regent fired a salvo of shots from the laser cannon into Aegis, hammering him into the side of the building until he, until the wall around him collapsed. He then paused to jam his taser into the control panel when his gun started to smoke. Regent made his way down, jumping the last four or five feet to the land on the dog's back. He checked the skateboard under one arm. Leave it, he said, Gru said. But tracking device. Assumes any tinker wor worth a damn is going to have tracking devices on their stuff. It's true, Telltale answered as, as Regent turned towards her. Sorry. Fuck, Regent swore. He jammed his taser into the underside of the skateboard like he had with, his, with the control panel, then threw it across the street. We mounted with Bitch sitting in front of Gru, mainly so he could suggest, support her, and Telltale behind me on Angelica, her uninjured arm wrapped around me. Regent was alone. Gru raised his arms and filled the streets with darkness. Angelica bolted, nearly un unseating me as she made a headlong run into absolute darkness. I was on a creature more than twice the size of a horse without a saddle and she wasn't suited for riding in the same way a horse was. I had one foot resting on a horn of bone that jutted from her side while the other dangled. My hands were gripping the straps we'd fitted on her and the only thing that kept me from tumbling backwards head over heels as she lunged forward at the run that would probably outpace any car would. Not, not that there would be any cars. The police and parahuman response teams would have to leave the area blocked off any any around any potential cave fights. Make our escape all more terrifying, I knew the dogs couldn't see. She was following Brutus by scent, and Brutus was going by Gru's direction, the blind leading the blind. I should have been terrified. My hands are cramping. Unable to see or hear, knowing I could tumble out off any second, but I was elated. Even when Angelica crashed into something hard enough to nearly knock us off, I didn't it didn't kill my enthusiasm. I hooted hard and cheered our victory, blaring, barely hearing any the noise myself as the darkness absorbed it. We've, we've done it. I'd done it. We escaped without killing anyone. The only ones we'd been really hurt at all were the wards, Glory Girl, and Pansia, and would have been, and would be fixed when Pansia came too, for sure. Any property damage had largely been the fault of the wards and Glory Girl. I'd maintain. I maybe made some enemies. I'd scared some innocent people. But I'd be lying to myself if I said I couldn't have been. Avo I, I said that could have been avoided. In short, things couldn't have gotten be have gone better. Okay, they could have gone a lot better. But the way that ended up, pretty damn good. After, pretty damn good, all in all. Agus would have climbed out of the rubble by now, flown up for a bird's eye view. If Gru was doing what he'd planned, he was filling every street and side street we passed with darkness. Agus couldn't see where or if we doubted or could see where or if we doubted doubled back or what the streets looked like, so he could only identify our location by the places where, where fresh darkness appeared. If he tried to get close to us Oops. If he tried to get close to us, though, we would have gone by the time he reached us. All I could do was follow our general direction. General location. Just when I thought I might not be able to hold on any longer, we pulled to a stop. Tattletail and I slipped off Angelica. Someone, someone probably grew, pushed a backpack into my arms. Even working in tall darkness, I managed to change a set of, into a set of civilian clothes we'd hidden away before we headed to the bank. 
I was handed an umbrella and, gra and gratefully, gratefully unfolded it with my stiff hands. It was tense waiting in darkness with only the feeling of rain on an umbrella to give me a sense of the world beyond myself and all the, and all end of t time passing. I I'm I can't English very well. Oh, we're back to just five viewers. Goodbye, two viewers. It was a long time before the world came into view again. Gru said his darkness faded after 20 minutes or so, but it felt like a far longer than that. As the darkness cleared away, I saw Lisa sitting on the steps in front of me on a, a shoe store, holding a leash in one hand and a paper, stopping, paper shopping bag in the other. Angelica, as normal as she ever was, was on the other end of the leash, sitting patiently. All around us were shoppers and pedestrians, each with their own umbrellas and raincoats, looking around with scared expressions and wide eyes. The sounds were refreshing after, silence of, after the sounds of the darkness, falling rain and the murmur of conversation. Lisa stood and winked at me as she tugged on the leash to get Angelica falling by her side. We joined the crowd of disoriented shoppers. Still says six? Oh, there we are. We do have six. Never mind. Assuming things went according to plan, Alec would be would be dropped off next without a dog, and he'd change into his civilian clothes the same way we had. Bitch, Brian, and the other two dogs would have made a final stop to the sh storage locker near the docks. Inside, they would change their change into their civvies, relax for a few hours inside, and leave the money for their boss to pick up. After taking a long enough break that the heroes would have been aban would have abandoned the pursuit, they would have made their way back to that. They wait. Oh, oh my God! After taking a long enough break. If the heroes would have abandoned pursuit, they would make their way back much as we were. Every, everyone came out of this unscathed, I asked Alta in a low voice. I was sharing my umbrella with her, so speaking together in a kind of huddle wasn't strange looking. No injuries or death for us, for the heroes or bystanders, she confirmed. Then it's a good day, I said. A very good day, she agreed. Arm in arm, we walked leisurely through downtown. Like everyone else, we craned our heads to the fall of the police cars and PRT vans as that were rushing to the scene of the crime were, were sirens, with, with sirens wailing. Two girls who just finished their shopping, walking their dog. And that, well, we have the interlude, but that is the end of Act 3. Interlude time, baby. That's my mom's birthday. Interlude 3. The building housing the local parahuman response team division didn't really stand out. The exterior was all windows, reflective enough to mirror the mottled dark gray of the sky overhead. Only a shield logo bearing the letters PRT marked it apart from the other buildings of downtown Brockton Bay. Those entering the lobbies would find a strange juxtaposition at work. On one hand, you can see various employees in suits hurrying in and out of the building, talking in groups. A team of four PRT officers was on standby, each stationed at a different area of the lobby, outfitted in the best equipment money could buy. All had chain mesh and Kevlar vests, helmets that covered their faces, and firearms. The, equip the equipment dif differed, however, as two of them had grenade launchers hanging on straps in their shoulders, with bandoliers of various specialty ammunition across their chest, including a fire extinguishing grenade an EMP round, and various stun grenades. The other two had appeared at what first glance would be flamethrowers were, were, were actually to pull the triggers. They would eject a thick, frothing spray of foam enough to contain all but the strongest and fastest villains. In stark contrast to this, there was a gift shop that would be thick, that would be thick with use where, when school ended, sporting a selection of action figures, posters, video games, and clothing. Four foot tall pictures of the various protectorate and the wards team were placed at regular intervals around the lobby, each backed by bright colors. It was a cheery tour guide waiting patiently by the front desk, smiling handsomely at anybody who happened to glance his way. On schedule, he would introduce tourists and children to the PRT offices, the armory, the training area, and the parking lot with parahuman containment vans, showing them what it took to, to maintain manage the local heroes. For those willing to pay for the premium tour, wait up for two, uh, wait, wait up to two hours, and to suffer a PRT squad escort, there would be an additional stop at the tour. A glimpse, a, 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 a glimpse of the wards' wards headquarters. 
As a beleaguered team of young heroes staggered into the lobby, however, there was no tour, only a heavy set woman with a bob. She wore a navy blue shirt, ja a blue suit jacket and skirt, and waited with a pair of stern looking men in suits behind her. Wordlessly, she led them through a door behind the front desk and into a meeting room. Director Pidgeot, ma'am, Agus greeted her, his voice strained. His costume was in shreds, and there was more crimson with his own it, more crimson with his own blood than it was its original white. It's bad enough his civilian identity might have been revealed if it weren't for a matter the matted blood and chunks of meat that had been taken out of him. Some of the wounds nearly a foot across. Good God, Agus! Her voice raised a fraction. You look like hell. What's wrong with your voice? Punctured lung, ma'am. Agus rasped. I think there's a hole in my front and back. As to demonstrate, he stuck his fingers in the chest in his chest cavity. Director Pidgeot didn't look away, but one of the men standing behind her looked at touchscreen around the gills. I can take I can take you at your word. You don't need to stick your arm all the way through your chest to demonstrate. Agus grinned and removed his hand to his chest. From his chest. Her expression hardened. I wouldn't be smiling right now. Agus's grin fell. He glanced over his shoulder at his teammates. Gallant, Kidwin, Vista, Browbeat, and Clockblocker were all wearing subtly somber expressions. This was a fiasco, she told them. Yes, ma'am. We lost, Gallant admitted. You lost. Yes, that's the least of it. You also caused horrific amounts of property damage. I'm afraid any and all destruction caused by the new wave's golden child is also your responsibility since you invited her along, without my say-so. I invited her, Gallant spoke up. I'll take the blame, and you can take the cost of, for the property damage out of my trust. Director Pidgeot offered him a thin and utterly humorless smile. Living up to your name, I see. Yes, I'm sure that's the best way to get the message across. Your teammates and I know you are under who you are under the mask. Everyone here, myself included, you're the you're the only, you're the one most able to handle a fine of tens of thousands of dollars. I won't deny it, ma'am. Gallant choked out the words. I'm afraid I'm a believer in punishment when punishment is due. Taking money from someone with money is spare, to spare is not going to mean anything. All of you will share all the fees between you, so I can't touch the trust funds the PRT will establish for you. I'll have to settle for docking your pay. Maybe next time the rest of you can talk Gallant out of inviting his girlfriend along. In protest overla overlapped. It was, this, it was her sister in the bank. She would have gone anyway. I, started, I start college next fall. <laughs> Director Pidgeot simply weathered the arguments and, co and complaints. A more cynical person might suggest she might enjoy might have enjoyed hearing them. When a minute or two passed, it was clear she wasn't going to reply or get dragged into arguments. The lung hero, the the, the lung, the young heroes fell into sullen silence. She cleared her throat and spoke again. Kid Win, I'm very interested to hear about the weapon you deployed on the battlefield. My alternator cannon? Kid Win asked, cringing just a bit. You'll have to forgive me. Pidgeot smiled. The paperwork gets a bit much sometimes. Maybe you know where to find the documentation from our military and science team for this alternator cannon. Christ, kid. Agus groaned out under his breath with his ruined voice. Kidwin looked more upset about Agus' reaction than anything else. I, uh, I didn't get it officially cleared yet. I thought it would be better to use the cannon and do what I could to stop the robbery. That's where you'd be wrong, Pidgeot told him. The fact of the matter is, the money that was taken from the banks falls very low on my priority list. You might even go so far as to suggest I don't care about it. Director, Agus started, he didn't even get to finish. What I care about is the public perception of capes. I care about ensuring that we get enough fun to keep you on, keep you wards. The protector and the PRT squads paid and equipped. Without that, everything I've worked for to build falls apart. What are you going to do? Kidwin asked her. The cannon gets dismantled, first off. No! Agus and Kidwin spoke at the same time. Director Pidgeot looked briefly surprised at the, de at the defiance. Hold on, I gotta take a sip of water. I started on the alternate alternator cannon so I'd have something to bring out in, a, in case of a I started on the alternator cannon so I'd have something to bring out in the case of a class A threat, Kidwin said. Getting rid of it would be such a waste. I don't care if I never have to use it again. Give it to your PRT squad. I'll teach someone how it works. You can mount it on one of the trucks or something. Director Pidgeot frowned. The amount, of time and the amount of time and money that would require for an event that might occur, that never occur, no, I suppose you can keep the cannon. Kidwin practically sagged with relief. Whatever the power source is, you're removing it and I'm keeping it under lock and key. If a Class A threat does come into play, I'll hand it over to you. 
and the canon still go goes through the standard review process for all Tinker ma created material. It doesn't pass the review. If you were putting people and property at undue risk with what you pulled today, I'm afraid you could face a substantial fine or jail time. Cape went pale. Director, Agus grunted out of the word, is taking a step forward. Be quiet, Agus. Tidget snapped. You're trying to speak with a punctured lung physically pains me. As much as I admire standing up for your team, your one lung full of breath is wasted here. Kidwin turned to Agus and offered a small apologetic smile. Kidwin, you're coming out with us for disciplinary, re disciplinary review. Everyone else is dismissed. The tour group is going to be coming by your quarters in an hour, and there's likely going to be more than a few reporters peering in the window. Try to clean yourselves up for the picture that are undoubtedly the pictures that are undoubtedly going to happen, going to appear in tomorrow's papers. Please. The two men in suits marched. A miserable kid went out the door and dir with direct after Director Pidget. Kid went and shot a worried look at his team before he was taken out of sight. We debrief, Agus, grun Agus grunted. Gallon or clock blocker handles it. You two decide. The team trudged out of the meeting room and made their way to a reserved elevator. It was tinkered designed to impress the tourists as well as be far more secure. Interlocking sections of metal unfolded and slid as they approached, then closed behind them. The ride down was so smooth that it was nearly impossible to tell the elevator was moving. They, exi they exited into a long corridor of chrome steel. I'm gonna have nightmares, Clockblocker groaned as he tenderly touched the welts around his nose and mouth. Nightmares with lots and lots of spiders. At the end of the, door at the, end of the corridor, they came to a security terminal. Agus pointed at Clockblocker. Don't you usually do it? Retina may be detached. Retina may be detached, Agus admitted in his, in his halting voice. Don't want a fail scan. Clockblocker nod, nodded hesitantly, then leaned forward to the terminal scan with his eyes. Steel doors clicked and the whisk opened with a barely audible whir, letting the young heroes and heroine make their way into the main area of their headquarters. The room was roughly dome-shaped, but there was a section of wall that was able to be dismantled and rearranged on the fly. Some had been set up to give the various team members their individual quarters, while others framed the doorways that led into showers, the filing room and their, pre and their press slash meeting room. A series of computers and large monitors networked at one side of the room, surrounded by a half a dozen chairs. One of the monitors, one of the monitors was displaying a countdown to the next tourist group, while the others were showing a camera images of key locations in the city. The central bank was one of them, a dark image punctuated by a red and blue of police sirens. Shadowstalkers AWOL? Gallon asked. Couldn't make it in time, Agus grunted. Told her to stay put. She's gonna hate that. Doesn't she have th ha have huge hate on for- Doesn't she have a this huge hate on for Gru? Walkblocker asked. Part of the reason. Gallon- Ag Agus grunted out his words. I told her to stay. Don't need that. I'm going to a shower. Patch myself up. You guys debrief. Share thing, chief. Walkblocker saluted. Take care of yourself. Fucking mutant dogs. Agus muttered as he made his way to the bathroom. He was stripped out of the top half of his tattered costume before he was he, he before he thought before he was through the door. Vista, can you go to grab the whiteboard? Can you go grab the whiteboard? Grab two. Gallant turned to her, their junior member. Vista almost skipped in her rush to follow the order. What's gonna happen to Kid? Browbeat smoke up for the first time. I don't know how it all goes. Is it serious? Gallon considered it for a moment. Could be, but my gut tells me Piggy just wants to scare him. He needs to stop testing the limits with the people in charge or he's going to get in some real trouble at some point. So not exactly the best start, start to your new career, huh? Clockblocker turned to Browbeat. Fuck, I wouldn't have minded so much if I knew what happened. Browbeat stretched and his muscles began to dwindle in size. At least then I could figure out what to do better next time. All I know was suddenly blind and... All I know, I was suddenly blind and deaf, and when I tried to move, everything bent the wrong way. Then I think I got tasered. Vista returned, dragging a pair of whiteboards on wheeled frames behind her. Hold that thought, Gellin told their newest member. Hey, Clock, you don't mind if I take a point? If I take point? Clock Blocker was still using his fingertips to explore the raised bumps on his face. Go for it. I'm going to procrastinate as long as I can on the leadership thing. You're the next oldest after Carlos. It's only going to be, what, three or four months before you're the senior member? And I'll hold that position for not even the rest of the summer before I graduate and pass the mantle to you. Clockblocker smiled and self self-deprecatingly. -deprecat no worries. Take charge. Gallon took off his helmet and held it in one hand, running his fingers through his sweat, damp, blonde hair. 
He smiled will willing winningly at Vista, and she positioned the whiteboard so everyone could see them. Thank you. Gallon didn't need to use his power to get an emotional response from the 13-year-old heroine. She turned to bright pink. There could be no doubt for anyone present that she had a major crush on her senior teammate. Okay, guys, Gallon said. Before we get started, I think it's important to make some things clear. First off, most importantly, today was not a failure. I'd even say today was a win for the good guys, and we start establishing that here and now. He took a second to gauge his audience disbelieving reactions, then smiled. The Undersiders, they've flown under the radar so far, but, the re but, until, but more recently they've started pulling high, higher profile jobs. They hit the Ruby Dreams Casino five weeks ago, and now they just robbed the biggest bank in Brockton Bay. The time we were lucky enough to get on their way, this time we were lucky enough to get in their way. That means we finally have intel on their group. He turned to the whiteboard and wrote the names of, her, of their opponents. Gru, Tattletail, and Hellhound went on the first board, with lines separating the board into three columns. He wrote Regent on the second board, and drew a line, and then hesitant, hesitated at a fifth and last column. Did he name himself? The guy with the bugs? Girl, Hawkbucker corrected him. I was talking to the hostages after the Undersiders made their, get their getaway. He said he was afraid to move because she was going to make, make it bite him. It took me a realize exactly... To, it took me a bit to realize exactly what he meant. Poor fellow was still in shock. We don't know what she calls herself. Nobody wants add to, Nobody had any answer to that. Then we need to g agree on a name for her, or the paperwork's going to be inconsistent. Suggestion for a name for Bug Girl? Maggot, Worm, Brown beat, uh, Browbeat offered. Stick her with a crappy name. We don't want to do that. Clockblocker sighed. Maybe if we'd won, we could get away with it. But it doesn't look good if we if. The press reports, if we if the press reports we got our asses kicked by someone named called Maggot, Stinger, uh oh, uh, it's Vista. I, I can't do a twelve year old girl's voice. I can't, I can't. Stinger, pestilence. <laughs> Vista suggested. Is she thirteen? I don't remember. You just said it like three seconds ago, and I don't remember. Hawk Blocker spun himself around in his chair and punched the names into his computer. Taken, Stinger's a villain in California with power armor, a jetpack and homing missiles, and Pestilence is a creepy psycho in London. Skitter? Gallant put the name out there. There's a clatter of keys as Clockblocker checked. It's not taken. Oh yeah! Yeah, yeah, yeah! Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears> then <throat> it's good enough, Gallant wrote the name on the whiteboard. Now we brainstorm. This is where we recoup our losses from the day. Figure out an angle so we can win next time. So don't hold back. Share any details, no matter how insignificant. Gru's power isn't just darkness. You can't hear in it either. And it feels strange, too. Browbeat smoke. There's resistance, like you're underwater, but not floating. Good. Gallant wrote, the in, wrote that in Gru's column. Next. I'm not going to do high-pitched voice for Vista. Oh, <laughs> the mutants that Hellhound makes, the dogs, she doesn't help, she doesn't control them with her mind. They're trained, Vista offered. She tells them what to do with whistles, gestures. Yes, I noticed that, Gallant replied, excitedly adding another note on the whiteboard. The girl with the bugs, Skitter, it's just the opposite. She has a lot of fine control over them, Clockblocker added. Yes. Also, according to the hostage I talked to, she said she can sense things through her bugs, which is how she kept an eye on, on the hostages. It wasn't long before most columns were, were full enough that Gallant had to turn the whiteboard around to use the backs. Carlos returned to the shower, sweat, wearing sweatpants and a towel around his shoulders. He was a Puerto Rican. He was Puerto Rican, his hair long. His body was clear of blood, bar barring a few residual trickles from the mess of ragged wounds on his arms, stomach, and chest. He had clumsily stitched the cuts and, ga and gouges together, which did surprisingly look a little, which which did surprisingly little to make them easier to look at. He sat down on a chair and added his input for the list, which didn't amount to much. Amounted to too much. He had been incapacitated for too long of to the fight to have much to say. <clears throat> there was an embrace of noise from the computer as every monitor suddenly flashed yellow. The wards hurried to put on their masks. Agus grabbed a spare from the drawer by the computers. <coughs> Ooh, excuse me. <clears throat> the entrance word opened and Arms Master strode in, accompanied by Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. I have to do Arms Master voice. Oh no. Oh fuck. 
an arms master stroller and accompanied by the the winsome Miss Militia. She wore a modified military uniform, tight enough to the essential areas to accentuate her curves, sporting a scarf around her lower face with an American flag embroidered on it, and a similar slat, a sash around her wrist. Most arresting, however, was the large rocket launcher she held across her shoulders in the same way a weightlifter might hold a barbell. Arms master, Gallon stood up. Good to see you, sir. Miss Militia, always a pleasure. Ever the gentleman, Miss Militia's eyes hinted at the smile behind her scarf. We brought a guest. Following behind Armsmaster and Miss Militia was a teenage girl in an, in an enveloping white robe, Pansia. She had an ID card on a cord around her neck, featuring her photo and the word guest in bright blue letters. She was kind enough to volunteer to come here and patch you guys up, Miss Militia told the young heroes. Can't send you home without horrible injuries and hundreds of bug bites, can we? That would give away the show. Oh no, not Arm. I, I really hope Armsmaster doesn't speak right now. She shifted the position of the rocket launcher on her shoulders, and it dissolved into a uh, blur of green-black energy. The energy lunged and, and arced around her for a few moments, then materialized into a machine gun. It only held that form for a few seconds before it flickered and solidified into a sniper rifle, then a harpoon gun, and then finally setting on the form of a pair of Uzis, one in each hand. She both seemed to notice beyond the automatic ex a action of holstering the guns. I want to thank you guys for coming to my rescue, Pansia spoke shyly, and for letting Glory Girl come with you. Gallon smiled, then a more concentrated tone, he asked, You two are okay? Pansia shook her head. Telltale found a way around my sister's invincibility. Glory Girl was bitten pretty badly, which is why I didn't come sooner. I think it hits you harder psychologically when you're pretty much invincible, but you get hurt anyway. But we're okay now. She's healed, but sulking. I... I'm alright. Bump on the head, but I'm okay. Good. Armsmaster was on the whiteboard, giving going over the points. I like these, but this one. He tapped on the column like tattletale tell, tell, tell. Nearly empty. None of us ran into her, and the hostages didn't say anything about her, Gallant replied. Pansia may be able to help them, Miss Militia offered. All eyes turned to the girl. I, I, a lot happened, Pansia hedged. Any details helps. Um, I'm sorry, she looked at the ground. She, looked, she said, looking down at the ground. I got smacked across the head. My powers don't work on myself, and I'm not really the type to go out in costume and get into fights, so having my life threatened, I don't know. All that, I can barely put my thoughts in order just yet. The sooner. Arms Master started. It's fine, Miss Militia interrupted him. Amy, why don't you start talk, taking care of the wards? Someone comes to mind anything. If something comes to mind, anything Endersider said or did, or any clues that you think might help, share it afterwards, all right? Pansia smiled gracefully at the heroine, then turned to the group. Who needs the help most? Agus? I'll live, Agus said. I can last. I can be last. Gallant hesitantly raised his hand. One of Hellhound's dogs slammed into me. I think I might have a broken rib. Panda paramedics cleared I uh, Pandemics. Paramedics cleared me, but I want to be extra sure I'm not risking a punctured lung or something. Pansia frowned and gestured at the far end of the room. Take a look at you over there. Go figure. Glory Girl's boyfriend gets special treatment. Clockblocker grinned to make sure, make clear he was poking fun. Gallant smirked in response. The pair went over to Gallant's alcove, and she set him down on the bed before laying a hand on his shoulder. She put her hood back and furrowed her brow. You don't have a punctured lung. You have, you got one fracture rib, but you're not even in that much pain. Why? I lied. I wanted to talk to you. Alone. He took her hand. She scowled and pulled her hand back like he'd bitten her, as to make doubly sure she wouldn't gra he wouldn't grab her again as she folded her arms. You know I can sense emotions, he said. Everyone's emotions, like a cloud of colors around them. Can't turn it off. It's just how I see the world. Victoria mentioned that. So you're an open book to me. I know you're scared. No, you're terrified. That's why you're not talking. She sighed and sat on the bed as far as gallon as far from gallon as she could. Never one of these powers. I never wanted these powers, period, he nodded. But I got them anyway, and I got into international attention over it. The healer, the girl who could cure cancer with a touch, make someone ten years younger, regrow limb loss, I'm forced to be a hero, burdened with this obligation. I couldn't live with myself if I didn't use this power. It's such an opportunity to save lives. But? but at the same time, I can't cure everyone. Even if I go to the hospital every night for two or three hours at a time, there are thousands of other hospitals I can't visit. Tens of millions of people who are terminally ill are living in a personal hell where they're paralyzed or in constant pain. People don't deserve to face that. 
I can't help them all. I can't help 1% of them if I put in 20 hours a day. You have to focus on what you can do, Yalin told her. Sounds easier than it is, Pansia answered with a touch of bitterness. Do you understand what it means to cure some of these people? I feel like every second I take to myself is a second I failed somehow. somehow. For two years it's been this. Pressure, I lie awake in bed. I, I lie in bed awake all night and I can't sleep. So I get up and I go to the hospital in the middle of the night. Go to the pediatrics, cure some kids. Go to the ICU, spare some lives. It's all blending together. I can't remember the last few people I saved. She sighed again. The last person I really remember was maybe a week ago. I was working on a kid. He was just a toddler, an immigrant from Cairo, I think. Ectopia cordis. It's where you're born with your heart outside your body. Is that a real disease? Oh my god. I was putting everything in the right place, giving a second chance at life. What made him so memorable? I resented him. He was lying there, fast asleep like an angel, and for just a second I considered leaving him. The doctors could have finished the job, but it would have been too dangerous. He might have died if I'd left him on the table. The job was half done. I hated him. Gallon didn't say anything, scowling Pansia, turned down turned down at the ground. No, I hated the that he would have had a normal life, because I'd given up I'd given up mine. I was scared that I might intentionally make a mistake, that I might let myself fuck up to the, pr the procedure to this kid. I could have killed him or ruined his life, but it wouldn't have been as it would have eased the pressure, lowered expectations, you know. Maybe it wouldn't have even lowered my own expectations for myself. I, I was just so tired, so exhausted. I actually considered for a brief moment but abandoning the child to let to, abandoning a child to suffer or die. Sounds more like just that. Sounds more than just exhaustion. Gallant replied quietly. Is that how it starts? The point I start becoming like my father, whoever he was? Gallant let out a slow breath. I could say no, you're never going to be like your father, but I'd be lying. Any of us, all of us, we run the risk of finding our own way down that path. I can't see the strain you're, go you're experiencing, the stress. I've seen people snap, be snap, snap because of less, so yeah, it's possible. Okay, she said under her breath. She waited for her to elaborate, but she didn't. Take a break. Tell yourself it's something you have to do, to recharge your batteries and help more people in the long run. I don't think I can. He sat in silence for a few moments. He turned towards her. So what does this have to do with what happened at the bank? She knew everything, that tattletale girl. She said she's psychic, and that from what she said, what she knew, I believe it. Gallant nodded. You know what it's like to talk to people like her? Like you, no offense? You build up this mask, you delude yourself into thinking everything's normal, and you force yourself to look at the past the worst aspects of yourself. And then Gallon and Tattletales just strip you naked. And these Gallons and Tattletales force you to strip you naked, force you to confront it all. I'm sorry. You said it yourself, you can't turn it off, right? I can't really blame you, it's just it's hard to be around. Especially after dealing with Tat especially after dealing with Tattletail. What did she say? She threatened to talk about stuff. Stuff worse than what I just told you, I guess. Threatened to tell me things I just don't want to know. She said she'd used she, what she knew to ruin my relationship with Victoria and the rest of my family. Amy hugged herself. My sister's all I've got. The only person with no expectations who know me as a person. Carol never really wanted me. Mark is clinically depressed. So, as nice as he is, he's too focused on himself to really be a dad. My aunt and uncle are sweet, but they've got their own problems, so it's just me and Victoria has been for almost the beginning. Smug little monster threatened to tear my sister and I apart yet another for no, yet, using another, yet another thing I didn't want, another thing I didn't have control over. Gallon started to speak then stopped. What? Does does this have anything to do with the uh, uh, rather strong feelings you have towards me? Pansia went still. I'm sorry, he hurried to say. I shouldn't have brought it up. You shouldn't have. She stood up and started towards the door. Look, if you ever need to talk, he offered. I... You probably won't want me to... You probably don't won't want it to be me, okay? But my door is always open, and you can call me at any hour. Just letting you know. She re Okay, she replied. Then she reached over and touched his shoulder. There. Bruise is gone. Ribs touched up. Thank you. He replied, opening the door for her. Take care of my sister, okay? Make her happy, she murmured as she hesitated towards the doorway. Goes without saying. They would join the main group. Every head in the protectorate, every head in the room turned as, the, as Pansia 
picked up the marker by the computers. The grim expression, with a grim expression on her face, she began filling in the tattletale section of the whiteboard. And we are done with arc four, arc three. I keep saying four, arc three. And I think, yeah, we're already at two, we're at two and a half hours. So I'm going to call it here. Uh, thank you all for joining me tonight. Um, I hope I could provide a couple hours of entertainment for you all. Um, I will see you back here tomorrow for, uh, I don't think we're going to do all, I think we're going to split it up like I did last week. We're going to probably do half of part four tomorrow and half of that part four next Sunday. But, uh, yeah, until tomorrow, um, I'll see you guys later. Stay safe, everyone, and uh, have a good night.